Good morning, every, good morning, everyone. I'm going to call meeting number six to the General Government Licensing Committee to order. I'd like to welcome committee members uh, to visiting members of council in attendance today to members of the public and to the media. You can follow the agenda and the debate on your computer, tablet, or smartphone at www.toronto.ca backslash council. Uh, in anticipation of interest on the vehicles for hire item, extra space and services have been provided at today's meeting to ensure that all persons are able to attend and follow the meeting. The General Government Licensing Committee acknowledges the land we're meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anadashabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty Number 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Uh, Green Sheets members in front of you has the speakers list for the items. There is one add-on for number uh, 25. Derek Moran has added his name to the list. Uh, we'll go through the agenda. Are there any declarations of interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act? Seeing none, uh, can I have a motion to confirm the minutes of our last meeting on May 21st, 2019? Councillor Holliday, all in favour? Carried. Uh, speakers and presentations, as I said, the green list is in front of us. Uh, we'll just go through the agenda. Uh, our first item is an overview of citywide real estate. There's a presentation by staff on that. Our second item is uh, the annual update on uh, the Ontario Municipal Employees Retirement System, or OMERS, as it relates to city employer contributions. There's a presentation on that. Uh, the third one, cancellation, reduction, or refund of property taxes as of June 21st, 2019 is the 9.45 action item. Timed item. Timed item, so we'll hold that for now. Uh, number four is a write-off of uncollectible property taxes from the tax roll. Anybody want to hold that or move it? Anybody want to move it? Councillor Holliday is moving number four. All in favour? Carried. Uh, number five is a status of outstanding payment in lieu of tax amounts for federal, provincial, and municipal properties. I have a motion. The report's not ready. So I'm moving a motion that item GL 6.5 be withdrawn from the agenda. All in favour? Carried. Uh, number six is the 2018 consulting services expenditures, city divisions, agencies and corporations. Councillor Fillion to hold that. Councillor Fillion's holding number six. Uh, number seven, progress on the mergers of the City of Toronto, pre-Ontario Municipal Employees Retirement System, OMERS pension plans with OMERS. Councillor Nunzi added moving number seven. All in favour? Carried. Uh, number eight is the Toronto Civic Employee Pension Plan proposed merger with the Ontario Municipal Employees Retirement System OMERS plan, implementation of OMERS indexing. Anybody like to move it? All. Councillor Holliday, so moved number eight. All in favour? Carried. Uh, number nine, Toronto Fire Department Superannuation and Benefit Fund uh, Funding Valuation Report as of December 31st, 2018. Councillor Holliday. Councillor Holliday is moving number nine. All in favour? Carried. Uh, number 10, Metropolitan Toronto Benefit Fund proposed merger with the Ontario Municipal Employees Retirement System, OMERS Plan, Implementation of OMERS Indexing. Councillor Nunn is the is moving number 10. All in favour? Carried. <laughs> number 11, the Corporation of the City of York Employee Pension Plan Surplus Distribution. Councillor Nunn is the moving number 11. All in favour? Carried. Number 12, insurance claims against the City of Toronto and mitigation measures to reduce claims. I'll, I would like to hold that. Councillor Nunn is holding number 12. 
Uh, number 13, 2018 final report on property sales, acquisitions, expropriation, and leases. And sorry, I have questions on that that are, uh, staff have told me it's confidential in nature, so we might have to leave that for the end. All right. Uh, number 14, real estate acquisition expropriation of property interest near the Christie subway station for easier access phase three project. Actually, I'm gonna hold that. Uh, sorry, that was 13. 14, 15, uh, expropriation of property interest near the Donland subway station for easier access phase three and secondary exit projects. Councillor Matlow would like to hold that. Uh, number 16, application of appro for approval to expropriate 39 Commissioner Street. Would anybody like to hold that? Anybody like to move it? Has anybody had their coffee today? <laughs> anybody? <laughs> Councillor Kerry Giannis is moving number 16. All in favor? Carried. Number 17. Land exchange with the Toronto District School Board, city acquisition of 200 Poplar Road in exchange for strati stratified ownership at 770 Don Mills Road. I'm gonna move that. All in favor? Carried. Uh, number 18, 20 Burnell Court, leases with the Toronto District School Board and the Toronto Catholic District School Board. Thank you, Councillor Nunziata. All in favor, the recommendations in number 18, carried. Uh, number 19, Community Space Tenancy Lease Agreement and Municipal Capital Facility Designation for Toronto Community and Culture Center at 1650 Finch Avenue East. <laughs> Councillor Matlow, would you like to move it? Rather You'd rather not, okay. This side of the room, anybody want to move it? <laughs> Do you want me to hold it? Holiday. Councillor Holliday is moving number 19. All in favor, carry. <laughs> Number 20, amendment to purchase order number 47020285, Ergo Industrial Seating Systems Incorporated, Ontario vendor of record for the supply of office seating and related services. So moved, all right. All in favor of number 20, carried. Number 21, a word of request for proposal number 919-19-0162 for the design, program management and contract administration services for accessibility upgrades to City of Toronto facilities at various locations. Councillor Matlow is moving number 21. All in favor, carried. Uh, number 22, a word of request for proposal number 919-197055 for property management services for canoe landing. Anybody? Councillor Matlow, moving it. All in favor, carried. Number 23, amendment for non-competitive contract number 47015908 with the YMCA of Greater Toronto for exclusive catering services at Metro Hall. Councillor Nunziata is moving number 23. All in favor, carried. Number 24, delivery of the East Bayfront Community Recreation Center. It's like being at my in-laws. <laughs> Anybody want to move it? We're so good, eh? <laughs> Councillor Karajanis is moving number 24. All in favor, carry. Number 25, increase some penalty, penalty amounts for stopping and parking violations. Okay. Councillor Karajanis would like to hold number 25. Uh, 26, feasibility of a New Year's Eve grace period for permit parking violations. Councillor Karajanis is holding number 26. 
Number 27, consideration of a startup in residence program in the City of Toronto. We have a deputation on that. Number 28, feasibility of changing the City of Toronto's policy on statutory holidays. Councillor Karagiannis. I think Councillor Karagiannis held it. Uh, number 29, Fair Wage Office, 2018 Annual Report. Councillor Holliday. Uh, number 30, Addition to the Records Retention Bylaw. Sorry, I'm going to hold that. I had a couple of questions. And number 31, Review of the City of Toronto Municipal Code, Chapter 546, Licensing of Vehicles for Hire. So we have we have a number of deputations on that. Okay. So going back to the beginning, that's it. Small agenda. <coughs> um, <coughs> do you want to deal with the 945s first? Okay. All right. We're going to go item number one, overview of the citywide real estate. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, members of the committee. Whenever um, you're ready. My name is uh, David Jollymore. I'm the program director for the citywide real estate program. With me here is Pat Matozo, and he is the incoming interim executive director of a new division <coughs> that we're going to talk about today, corp uh, corporate real estate management division. So between us, we're going to give an update. You can flip to the next slide. We're going to give an update on the citywide real estate review, our citywide real estate model, which we've been working through for the last couple of years. We're going to provide a background progress to date, as well as next steps relative to our work on the citywide real estate model. And then I'm going to hand it over to uh, Mr. Matozo to go through the new corporate real estate management division. So we'll inter introduce what it is, some key projects and initiatives, and give a bit of a heads up to the committee in terms of reports that we're working on that we're going to be bringing forward in the, uh, in the near future. So I'm going to start out with uh, um, an overview of the citywide real estate review, starting with the fact that the city owns uh, one of the largest and most complex and most valuable portfolios in Canada. And you can see the stats here associated with this property. Um, you know, 8,500 properties, 30,000 acres of land, almost 7,000 buildings, a billion, uh, a billion in operating and capital on an annual basis, and an assessed value of $27 billion. So really the idea around citywide real estate was uh, better, more effective stewardship and management of this very large and valuable portfolio. And fundamentally, this portfolio enables city program, it, it, it really allows the city to deliver its services. So the vast majority of programs that the city provides is delivered through its real estate. So just to give you a sense for a key business challenge and fundamentally what we were trying to achieve with the citywide real estate model was to centralize the stewardship of this most valuable asset. And that's really um, dealing with the authorities, the decision making and the service delivery as it relates to the management of this portfolio. So as you can see, we're moving from, um, we're moving from a state that where we didn't have a citywide portfolio plan that looks at the portfolio through a citywide lens. So, you know, we're, our, our, I guess past state, and we're still kind of working our way through this, but we have decentralized, a decentralized situation as it, as it relates to the management of the portfolio. And what we want to set out to do is really moving towards uh, centralizing the stewardship for the planning um, and the management of, of the real estate assets. And why do we want to do this? It's really about centralizing the intelligence and the decision making as it relates to the best use of this asset, the most effective way of managing uh, operating and capital dollars associated with it. And really it's about delivering service in the most cost effective way. Um, and that's a capital uh, comment and that's also an operating comment. Just to give you a sense for the history, we started working on 
uh, the development of this model back in the late 2015. We partnered with uh, a consulting firm. We did a review of the service delivery model. We brought forward our report in June of 2016, whereby we presented council with the what we wanted to do, and that was really about centralizing the service delivery model across city divisions, agencies, and corporations that were involved in, in real estate service delivery. We then spent another year looking at how we would go about doing that. So we brought our, our report forward in May of 2017, um, and that's where council adopted the how we would proceed forward in terms of uh, centralizing the service delivery model. Um, in preparation for that, we brought a report in late 2017, whereby our first order of business was to consolidate authority uh, associated with real estate transactions. And on January the 1st of 2018, we launched Create TO, um, and we expanded the, uh, uh, we, we provided corporate services a citywide mandate for real estate service delivery on a citywide basis. So between launching Create TO and an expanded citywide mandate in corporate services, January 2018 is when we launched the model. Since that time, we've also uh, fired up um, uh, staff committees, which enable the, the model, including city building committee, a strategic program management committee to ensure that we're focused on programs and, and enabling programs. Um, and we undertook other activities through the course of 2018 with a focus on some citywide contracts and, and uh, a focus on fire and life safety um, and ensuring that we're doing everything we need to do in our portfolio to address matters related to that. Um, we're now about to launch a new city division while collapsing some of the current city divisions um, called Corporate Real Estate Management or CREM. Um, and then ultimately over the next couple of years, um, and we had, we had always uh, planned to incubate this new model for a three-year period. At the end of 2020, we will be doing a review of the model, its effectivity, um, take stock in terms of what changes we need to make, and then we'll move forward from there. Um, everything that we do relative to the citywide real estate model is anchored in its mandate, and there's really three key parts to the mandate. It's about asset stewardship, which I'll talk about a bit more in a minute. It's about focusing on programs. So fundamentally, this model is in place to ensure that programs are enabled to provide their service. And it's also about enabling city building. So again, looking at the real estate through a citywide lens and looking for opportunities to get the, the most and best out of our portfolio is really the, the objective here. And uh, one of the key areas of focus has been enabling city building in, in consultation with city programs and other partners like city planning, economic development and culture, social uh, development, finance and administration, among others. So our focus here and what Pat is going to talk about in terms of the creation of a new corporate real estate management division is really about the asset stewardship piece. And fundamentally, this is, this is focused on three key aspects. One is about improving service. So we want to make sure that we're providing the best service relative to real estate and facilities management related services. So that includes core real estate services that are currently provided by the Real Estate Services Division, facilities management uh, services, which are, um, which are provided by a number of different city divisions and agencies currently, um, energy management, given that um, energy and utilities is uh, the top um, cost as far as the, as the portfolio is concerned, um, as well as corporate security. So it's about improving service. Secondly, it's about the effective use of real estate. So it's looking at how we get the most invested of our real estate um, and looking at the portfolio for um, opportunities to co-locate city services and, uh, you know, um, modernize our portfolio and rationalize it um, and think forward in terms of planning what the future needs are relative to real estate. What do we need to support 20, 30 years from now in terms of uh, our real estate? And then it's about asset management. And really what that boils down to is the, is the most effective use of capital and operating dollars relative to this, to this particular asset type. Um, the other thing that we're doing here as we, um, as we um, move the model forward is ensuring that we are aligned to what the industry be best practice is. 
Um, and really the idea here is that we are able to scale this organization to support the needs on a citywide basis. So, you know, we, we have a combination of different groups that are still involved in, in various different aspects of real estate service de delivery, for example, facilities management services. But what we want to do here is to align to an industry standard model. And if you look at the chart, um, the green portions are what we had put in place on January 1st of 2018 in the creation of CreateTO, which is the city's real estate agency. And on the right-hand side, um, in corporate services, and it's really about um, management and service delivery relative to real estate service and facilities management service. In terms of progress to date, um, you know, since the beginning of January of 2018, a lot of, pro a lot of good progress has been made. We launched the model, we put new functions in place in CreateTO, most notably the citywide real estate portfolio planning group, which again, looks at the opportunities um, in the real estate portfolio on a citywide basis. Um, client relationship management function to ensure that we're providing, the, getting inputs from programs in terms of their real estate needs and providing the best level of service back to the programs in the support of, of their uh, program delivery. We transition the business from the former corporations as we merge them together and create it, uh, the new agency called CreateTO. Um, and create the, the formation of CreateTO wasn't simply the merger of those former corporations, it was the merger of those former corporations and a much bigger, bolder, and broader mandate with it. Um, and that, that relates to the next, which is um, living the new mandate and bringing, and we're gonna talk about the reports that we're gonna be bringing forward, um, uh, you know, um, advancing city building projects, for example, Etobicoke Civic Center, Danforth Barnes, and, and other uh, key programs, including Housing Now. And then it's also about modernizing and optimizing. So, you know, over the last couple of years, we've been taking the opportunity to ensure that we are looking at ways to, um, to get more to the portfolio. And we've had a specific focus on the office portfolio, and we've made some good progress in terms of advancing our office modernization pilots, which have resulted in over $3 million of savings to date. Uh, we're gonna talk about uh, reports that we're bringing forward um, in the next few months that will um, scale that to a much greater extent. And then finally, just before I hand it over to, um, to Mr. Matozo, just wanted to kind of put in perspective here what we had intended to set out to do when we brought our report back in June of 2017. And there, are, there really are four key things that we need to do in order to advance the model and get what we want to get from it in terms of improvements. So the first was amending authorities to centralize land use decision making and we kind of have a check in the box on that particular one. So um, as of January the 1st of 2018, um, the model is responsible for, um, for uh, land use decisions and real estate related transactions come through the model today. Kind of looking forward, um, there's you know, two or three big things that we want to do to advance the model further. Um, centralizing asset planning and capital uh, planning would be one of those. Um, and at the corporate level, there's a tremendous amount of focus on, on understanding what's, what assets the city owns and better management of those assets. And council adopted uh, this, the, uh, the city's policy relative to um, asset management last week at council. Um, second, or sorry, third would be centralizing the operational strategy and the management and stewardship of the buildings, right? So that we can better meet regulatory requirements surrounding service in those buildings and be more effective in the service delivery in those buildings. So that includes things like the development of practices um, and frameworks that, that the business can uh, operate within. And then finally, it's about streamlining frontline service delivery and really being clear as to who does what because we still have a highly distributed model in terms of you know, uh, facilities management service provi provision in our 2,500 buildings that we have, not including TCH and Toronto Hydro. And really what this is about, it's about the reduction of capital, the reduction of operating costs, and maximizing value from, uh, from our real estate portfolio. So now I'm going to hand it over to uh, Pat Matozo to talk about the new City Division Corporate Real Estate Management.
Thank you, David. Uh, so the slide outlines the operational business lines of, uh, of corporate services. As you can see, we have nine uh, divisions and sections that currently report into the deputy city manager. As David had noted, the creation of the uh, corporate real estate management division marks an important uh, milestone for us in terms of the citywide transformation, in terms of bringing together um, real estate services, facility management, property man uh, sorry, project management, space management, corporate service, sorry, corporate security, and sections of, um, of energy functions that relate to the support of internal um, uh, buildings that, uh, that we manage. The, the key here is to develop an integrated service delivery model so that we can support the citywide uh, real estate transformation. The integration will also allow us to centralize the stewardship of, of real estate assets and of course to promote the development and comprehensive consistent asset management practice which David had alluded to. So under the new corporate real estate services uh, model, uh, by integrating the multiple divisions, we'll simplify the organization because what we want to do is, is have clear lines of accountability within, within the corporate real estate management division to ensure we can deal with, from an integrated perspective, all facilities and re uh, re real estate uh, related issues. So as, I, as you can see, the executive director of corporate real estate management will report directly into the deputy city manager. So what we're doing is, is uh, bringing together real estate facilities, project management, corporate security, and business management effective July 2nd. Um, which this will allow us to build um, not only focus, sorry, just on functional line service excellence, but our goal is actually to build an integrated service delivery model um, and focusing again on, on providing, uh, again, a, you know, for us it's about workplace, uh, sorry, a compliant workplace environment, quality service, and being able to support the core functions of all divisions, agencies, and corporations. So I'll take you through some of the key milestones that uh, to build out this new division. Over the past year, we've worked uh, collectively as an organization to develop the corporate real estate model. And a key function as well is we've uh, undertaken um, operational reviews. Recently, we completed the project management uh, operational review. We're currently undertaking an operational review of facilities management, and this is all around aligning our, our service delivery model in, in anticipation of, of the citywide uh, real estate transformation in terms of consolidating and collapsing all of, the, all of the real estate services citywide. In 2019 and 20, we'll also undertake real estate reviews, sorry, uh, real estate reviews and operational reviews of uh, real estate services and security services. Once we've completed all of our operational reviews and building and supporting processes and technology solutions, our, our goal is then to start onboarding uh, divisions, these agencies and corporations. We're actually gonna start with some of the smaller divisions uh, and agencies that are less complex and easier to integrate in and take the lessons learned from that as we work through the three-year incubation to bring on some of the larger divisions. Some of the key projects and, and initiatives we're currently working on, as David, David talked about, the creation of an asset man management strategy, that's key to, to what a key function of what we're doing in terms of looking at our building portfolio from how we use it, the age, uh, the type, and it helps guide the decisions, that, as David had alluded to, in terms of operating and capital dollars. A big part of, the, of what we need to do as well is, again, process standardization. I talked about an integrated service delivery model, so that's key. So it's not only about the functional service line excellence within real estate facilities, project management, corporate real estate, and business management, but it's more building that more horizontal integration. So we're looking at the complete life cycle asset, uh, of, sorry, complete life cycle of an asset. Data, data collection and process and data is important to us too. Um, you know, right now our key focus, so we're ensuring that all of our building inventory is up to date because that's key for us as we move forward is understanding what our buildings have and what they do for us. We also have a series of, of, uh, of scalable approaches we're taking. First and foremost is the establishment of the, of the Fire Life Safety Program Office and uh, establishing standards and policies that will support a citywide initiative. We also have, we've taken a programmatic approach to uh, capital delivery and looking at where we, you know, bringing like projects together, either to be managed by a project manager or team, 
Uh, we're also looking at emergency planning and, and, and preparedness in terms of from a citywide perspective and service consolidation within corporate security with, with the Toronto Parking Authority and the Toronto Public Library. Other key initiatives we're currently working on is strengthening our contract <coughs> vendor management. We've brought on some, some um, experts within our strategic sourcing group and working with PMD, MD, specifically from a facilities and real estate perspective, and they have been working to develop uh, vendor management frameworks and outcome performance measures and, and looking at more from a master service agreement where it makes sense to consolidate corporate-wide contracts. The first one we've completed this year was our elevator contract, which we put out earlier this year. We're currently working on two others right now. One is, is for custodial services and for fire life safety services. We also have, um, as David had alluded to, we're currently working with our partners at CreateTO and other divisions for Tobacco Civic Centre, the Dam Fourth Garage, St. Lawrence Hall Precinct, as well as future uses for the St. Lawrence, um, St. Lawrence Precinct as a whole, and as well as looking at Old City Hall and its future uses. We have some key reports coming up in the following months. The first uh, report we have at the end of the week is with respect to uh, the cleaning audit recommendations next this Friday. We'll be reporting back in September uh, with respect to fire life safety. We have a Tobacco Civic Center relocation in October. That one's actually going to exec committee. Uh, David's going to talk about the citywide uh, real estate portfolio strategy report. So we are preparing to bring forward the first citywide real estate portfolio strategy whereby we've organized our, our very large and complex portfolio into key asset classes and we expect to advance on the first one being office um, and we're preparing to bring that report. Um, in order for us, we've also identified a short term opportunity in terms of lease uh, reduction in 2020. Um, so we are going to be bringing a, a report forward to Executive Committee on July the 4th to advance that work um, during which time we prepare to bring forward the more strategic portfolio strategy report. And the two final reports we have uh, uh, in, uh, in Q4 are the uh, Old City Hall Future Uses and Tenants Options in October and of course the Enhanced Security Measures at City Hall Update in November. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, questions of staff, Councillor Matlow. Uh, thank you for uh, for your presentation. As as you uh, put together, by the way, uh, when is when exactly is your portfolio report uh, going to be published? We expect to bring that report forward to the CREATO board in September and to executive committee in October. With the passage of Bill 107. Do you have a handle yet on the impact that it will have on the TTC portfolio? Given, and I'll give you some examples. Within my ward alone in Midtown Toronto, we are currently working on the, um, the redevelopment of the derelict bus barns with Oxford. Uh, we have the, uh, the tracks south of there where in our official plan, we uh, have a plan to deck it over and create a park. Uh, there are a number of TDC real estate properties that we have city building strategies. But given that the province now has uh, plans, uh, stated plans, to take over those properties, do we have a handle yet on you know, what we're doing here? So um, we don't have a thorough understanding at this point in time because a thorough understanding of the impacts of Bill 108 aren't yet understood. Well, 107 in this case. Sorry, 107. Um, well, actually, let's go to Bill 108. Um, so we don't have a handle on Bill 107, uh, which is, for those who don't understand, is the essential uh, allowance for the takeover of, of our subway properties. But then for Bill 108, do we have a handle on even what our, what our abilities or inabilities might be with respect to even our plans moving forward for redevelopment of our sites? Same comment as 107. Okay, thank Same you. answer. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Matlow. Other questions on the presentation? Seeing none. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Speak. Did you have your motion ready, Councillor Matlow? I, I have a motion. I literally add uh, one word to it. Um, 
Did you want to speak to it, or, sure. or do you want to? Um, I'll just start, and then we'll have the motion presented. But it, but it, essentially, my, my motion uh, will be uh, that uh, uh, on, by September 4th, by the next committee meeting, that uh, we uh, have a report on the impacts of Bills 107 and 108 on the city building strategies um, uh, with our real estate portfolio with respect to social services, uh, parks, um, and affordable housing. And uh, the reason I ask for this is because uh, we need to, to the best of our ability, and they may, by the way, they, they may well, candidly, just come back and say, we have no idea. Uh, but we need to we need to try to get a handle on what this means uh, to our uh, strategies with respect to our real estate. Uh, what Doug Ford has done, he's created absolute chaos with all of our plans. And whether one agrees or disagrees with all the plans or one of the plans or another one of the plans, with respect to our plans for transit, with respect to our official plan, with respect to our secondary plans, everything's been thrown up in the air and uh, rewritten, and we're still waiting for even specific regulations to be uh, 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 concluded as far as even what the specific detailed impacts are. I gave a couple of examples to, uh, to the presenters earlier, uh, colleagues, about um, the, the, the bus barns at the southwest corner of Young and Eglinton. Uh, those are TTC lands. We are in the middle of a transaction with Oxford Properties. Uh, there is a redevelopment plan that both uh, brings in revenue to the city, much needed revenue to the city, but also uh, respects our official plan and creates a really grand public space at the corner of Young and Eglinton. Uh, we have another part of our Midtown and Focus plan, which is part of our official plan, or at least what we passed, uh, to uh, deck over the, uh, the, uh, the tracks uh, south of Eglinton uh, to create more park space and to redevelop some of those properties too. But the whole idea of our plans has been about city building. So it's been both about um, bringing in much needed revenue to support our services and rebuild our infrastructure throughout the city, but also to make sure that we do that in combination with affordable housing and social services and remarkable public realm. In other words, build communities rather than just sell off to a bunch of developers to build whatever they want as much as they want, sky's the limit. And I'm concerned about uh, the latter being the case with respect to the Ford government's plans. So um, it's one thing to say that we have a portfolio strategy, but if we have no idea how the provincial decisions are impacting our strategies, uh, then we don't have a strategy. We have aspirations, but we don't have a strategy. Uh, everything will be for naught if we don't even understand what the rules of the game are. And, um, but you know, in fairness to those who presented before us, they wouldn't have a chance to know the rules of the game because they're often announced far before any consultation or discussion is even had with the City of Toronto, which is shameful in itself. So um, I look forward to a report either to provide us with some more details about what we've learned uh, or candidly telling us uh, that we really are a loss of what the province is doing and then we need to take action based on that information. Um, and I know your motion says including, but sometimes you know, staff give greater priority to the ones that are listed. Um, so I'm wondering if you're, if you would be okay with adding community facilities and culture to the. He's easily happy with that. Yeah. Okay. Thank yeah. you. And I, and, and I imagine that there's much more on the list that I just didn't even conceive of at this yes. point, but I just we, we will learn. the biggies that were. Yeah. 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 Sorry. Other questions of the mover? Seeing none. Okay. Thank you. Any other speakers on this item? Seeing none. Um, I just want to thank staff for the presentation this morning, uh, for the work they're doing, the due diligence they're doing. Uh, facilities and real estate's a huge uh, portion of the work that we do here. Um, I'm happy to see they're using best practices in a lot of the different areas uh, that they're working on. Josie, I liked your picture. Looking forward to more pictures in the slide deck of the staff. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, so we have Councillor Matlow's motion.
Okay, so Councillor uh, Matlow's friendly amended motion is on the screen. All in favor? Carried. Uh, motion to receive the staff presentation. Oh, okay, we're all good then. All right, we're all good. All right, thank you. Um, can I deal with time item? Okay. Uh, we're going to move on to item number two. Item number two is the annual update on the Ontario Municipal Employees Retirement System, OMERS, as it relates to the city's employer contributions. And I would like to welcome back uh, Mr. Joe Panichetti and Mr. David Beatty. Thank you, gentlemen, for coming back to, uh, again. Uh, so this is the third year that uh, David and Joe have been in to update us on the OMERS uh, uh, system. Uh, I asked for this initially because I think it's very important. OMERS, as the largest city of Toronto, employee, employees and pensioned employees, as the largest members of OMERS, I thought it was important that we get an annual update. So I, thought I want to thank you for coming in again, gentlemen, and proceed whenever you're ready. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you. Mr. Chair, to committee members, um, as the chair has highlighted, this is our, I think, fourth uh, year coming, and we we do this on an annual basis, and we appreciate the time that uh, the committee allows us to give you an update on your plan. Uh, just a few introductions to begin with. David Beatty, that uh, was referred to by the chair, is your other uh, board representative, along with myself. Uh, again, David. <coughs> Strong, strong background in investment. He's been on the board since 2013, and I've been on the board since 2016. A few other staffers that are uh, with us in, uh, in case there's some detailed questions that we can't answer. Blake Hutchison, President and Chief Pension Officer. I, I know that many of you know Blake. Uh, Michelle Bennett, Chief People Officer. Uh, Chris Vandenhock, Vice President of Pension Strategy Governance uh, for the OMRA Sponsors Corporation, and Oliver Chersko, Director of Employer St Stakeholder Relations. Um, basically, we've got about a 10-minute presentation that we'll go through quickly. Hopefully, Mr. Chair, it's okay to hold questions to the end. Um, I'm going to start with some basics. Some of the uh, committee members uh, I, I know are new to this committee. Uh, some basics on the plan itself. Very, very large plan that the chair referred to, almost 500,000 members. I would highlight almost 300,000 active uh, employees, members uh, of the plan. Uh, the retired group that we've highlighted over the years is growing. Uh, and that's part of our pressures into the future. A thousand plus employers, uh, as you'll see on this chart, um, about 50% municipalities, but the other local boards, 24%, of course, are largely boards, commissions, et cetera, that fall under municipalities, including, TT, or including the police board, health, et cetera, that would uh, fall under that category. I do want to highlight that Many think it's all municipalities and municipal employees. There is about a third that are school board non-teaching positions that are part of OMERS. Uh, in addition to that, under other local boards, you have examples of the Children's Aid Society that's actually part of OMERS. So roughly two-thirds are municipal staff and about a third are, say, provincial staff within uh, OMERS. And of course, large number of unions and associations related to all of the employers and employees. Uh, break out, again, education-wise for those new members. There's two boards. It's called a bicameral system that was set up by the province for OMERS. We have what we refer to the, as the administrative corporation. That's what David Beatty is your representative of. Uh, 15 board members, seven each employee and employer an independent board chair, George Cook, 
And the prime responsibility is the day-to-day -day administration of the plan, and of course, the other large focus is the investments and in ensuring that we get a large return on our value with an annual plan valuation that is also a key component for AC. For the Sponsors Corporation, where I rep represent you, again, 14 board members, seven each of employee-employer, two co-chairs um, that are members of the board. Uh, the main purpose, responsibility for the SC is board co composition, meaning appointment to all of all the board members for both boards, setting contribution rates and reserves, and of course, plan design. So those last two pieces need to say key uh, responsibilities for the sponsors corporation. In terms of the composition of uh, management and boards, you received a, a report from staff last meeting. I wanted to just reiterate this. If there are any questions uh, later on, we're happy to answer. It's suffice to say that this data is, is the latest data. Uh, I'll be speaking to a 2030 strategy update. We have a priority action on diversity and equity relative to staff and, and the board uh, for OMRs going forward. And, and then finally, uh, before I turn it to David, um, four pillars to our 2020 strategy. Uh, we, uh, we have always, and OMRs as a board has always ensured a priority is on the funded status, maximizing returns, building strong relationships, re relationship governance-wise, especially with members, sponsors, stakeholders, and of course sponsors meaning yourself, and then finally moving on a business model to realize all of our funding status. With that quick background, I'll turn it to David to walk through uh, more of the administrative investment side of uh, our of OMERS. Uh, thank you, Joe. My name is David Beatty. I'm on the AC board. I've been there since 2013, and I also sit on the investment committee and the human resource committee with Michelle Bannock, uh, who is behind us. Over the last 10 years, OMERS has had an 8% return. The 2018 results were 2.3%, or about a 2.2 billion net investment income, and I'll explain that on the next slide. The net assets are close to $100 billion today, and the funded ratio is 96, 97 percent. That's improved every year since 2013 when I joined the board uh, from 87 percent. Over the next slide, you'll see the one, three, five, and 10-year returns. What's important to understand here is our asset mix is split roughly 50% public assets, 50% private assets. You typically earn about 6% on the public assets and about 10% on the private assets. Over the next page shows a key tenet of our strategy. That is a diversification both by asset mix and asset class and a geographic diversification. Real estate is principally in Oxford properties. Um, you'll see their buildings and renovations um, just south of Queen and Richmond with a number of the buildings underway. Private equity is a mid-market private equity in both Canada, the United States, and the UK, although increasingly we're doing deals in Europe and through a new office in Singapore. Infrastructure is another major component of that. Infrastructure provides very steady, stable returns. So that adds up to about 51% private assets. The remainder you'll see is 29% fixed income. There's been a big rally in the bond market. That's a very positive thing. And public equity is about one third. So when you see the returns down, in December, the equity markets were down 18%. If you're one third equities, that's 6%, and that was the change. That has rallied right back to record highs on the S&P, close to it on the TMX. Um, and we've, we actually invested more money at the bottom in December, so that was a very good move uh, by our chief investment officer. There's a conscious geographic diversification on the right side of this slide. 
You can see about 44% of our assets are in the United States, 30% in Canada, and 26% in the rest of the world. Consciously to take advantage of the rapid growth in Asia, we opened a modest office in Singapore uh, and have begun investing in Asia, both in India and in China. Over the next page, you'll see that the smooth funded ratio has improved steadily over the last seven years. So we're at about 97%. There's a difference between the smooth, which is an actuarial calculation uh, done by Towers Watson, and a fair value, which is the actual market value. So that's a favorable difference for us. Over the next page, you'll see that we have systematically been lowering our discount rate. This is in a world where interest rates and inflation are lower um, than we had expected earlier. With that, I'm going to turn it over for the Sponsors Corporation update. So as your member for uh, Sponsors Corporation, I'll go through three or four slides and give you some key highlights. Uh, I start with this slide that follows on, on what David just covered in terms of our 96, 97% funded ratio, which will, would sound very high and that we're, we're virtually there. Um, this literally is a graph that shows our funding ratio and our contribution rates. And I know it's very busy, but I'll give you the key highlights. Since inception of OMERS in 1963. So call it during the 20th century, we had a very steady, healthy plan. Um, that marched along with about 100 to 110 percent funded uh, ratio, um, very relatively low contribution rates, a very strong plan. In 1998, the board decided when the funding ratio skyrocketed up to 100, above 125 percent to actually give contribution rate holiday. Some councillors may recall this. Um, what happened was we hit a perfect storm. Just after making that decision was the tech recession of 2000. So you can see in that gray peaked area, our funding ratio just plummeted below 100% to about 90 to 93%. And the bottom line is since 2000, we have not got back up to 100% funding. That is at a high level, the picture of what our challenge is to try to get the plan back up into full funding ratio of 100 to 110% ideally, the way it was um, 20, 30 years ago. In terms of the uh, most recent review that we presented to the committee last year, uh, the, we had a comprehensive plan review that, that reviewed all plan design options for uh, the uh, for OMERS uh, relative to our uh, assessing our financial health, uh, considering all, we considered all plan changes, including modernization of, of various pieces, and had a, a very thorough sponsor and stakeholder engagement related to these plans. All always looking to our plan objective of having a sustainable, meaningful, and affordable uh, plan for generations to come, not just for the next 10 years, but for, for employees that are just starting in municipalities. The final uh, recommendations by the board um, less than six months ago was mainly around equity. We removed the 35-year service cap. As we all know, many uh, employees are staying on for a lengthy period of time now, beyond 35 years. So we saw it as being fair to allow uh, employees to go beyond the 35-year cap. Uh, and then importantly, the paramedics in our A60, uh, while the paramedics were allowed per taxes to be included within NRA 60. Uh, OMRAs had historically not allowed it and not allowed employers or sponsors to uh, negotiate with paramedics for this, uh, for this option. The board, I think, unanimously approved the uh, 
option now for employers for the City of Toronto to negotiate with paramedics to provide the same option that police and fire have today. So those were the two uh, key design changes made uh, last year. Um, looking ahead, um, starting on the far right side, and this has been highlighted uh, annually, we have a mature plan. The active to inactive, um, call it active to retiree ratio is getting very close now. Within 10 to 15 years, the active to retiree ratio will be one to one. That puts pressure on the plan. That's part of longevity as well with, peop uh, with the uh, s staffers staying on longer. Uh, and of course we have workforce trends, meaning that uh, the growth in our workforce has not been what we were hoping for in past projections. And of course we have a fairly complicated CPP enhancement that is still being reviewed. So there's a lot of work to be done. We've got a lot of issues related to fairness and equity, uh, but most importantly we want to ensure that, that we have a, a strong fiscal sustainable plan for, for, uh, for the City of Toronto, for all employers uh, and sponsors going forward. And finally, a, a strong focus to meet those challenges is a focus in the next year or so on risk management. Uh, basically that is, oh sorry, closed plans. You already have reviewed and approved the closed plans. I'll just uh, suffice to say that a strong working relationship in the transition with staff uh, from the city along with staff at OMERS. I think everything is going well uh, for the new councillors that aren't aware of the details of this. I, I, I use the term win, win, win when we uh, approved that OMERS and the city approved it. It was a win for OMERS to consolidate all plans under OMERS. It was a win for the, the old plan members because they now have the sustainability of a plan including indexing and consistency with owner's plans and finally the City of Toronto will do well financially. That's it, Mr. Chair. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, questions on the presentation? Councillor Holliday? Thank you uh, for coming to speak to us. Um, it's actually double interesting because I, I think we're all OMERS pension members here. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, it's come up a couple of times and there's correspondence on this is uh, some, some words from COTAPSA. They've been observing the plan um, and maybe if I can characterize it, they've been doing a watchdog function. Um, they've been looking at some of your expenses and some of the structures that you've got, some of the policies and they have some criticisms and they brought them forward. I guess my, just my general question is, it's concerning when you've got a watchdog group that's raising these things. Um, is there any plan going forward from OMERS to try to address and try to reconcile some of the concerns that they've raised? And you know, one of the basics is there's always a call for more transparency and more information out there for them to review. Do you have any thoughts going into the future on how to, to bring these two um, opposing thoughts together. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'll start with Katapsa has been following up and, and writing to us on a regular basis um, for probably a year and a half. Um, from a, as a board member uh, and, and from the staff viewpoint, we have been open and transparent with all our information, no different than any other pension fund. We've been uh, providing, in fact, one-on-one -on -one meetings on a regular basis and inviting um, Mr. Major and, and Katapsa to the table to discuss any specific issues. I'll say that there are a number of times where they'll issue a letter to us and, and you may get copied um, and we offer to meet, but that doesn't follow up. Um, I'll say that, that you know, Virtually every issue that's raised, we deal with, we respond to, we give the details to uh, CATAPS in writing. If there's something more than that, we've offered to meet. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest and say that there are, is no other sponsor, a stakeholder, that we have an issue with like this. Um, and 
we are doing our best as board members and as staff to work with them to uh, <clears throat> explain any issues they have. And, and from my viewpoint, Councillor, I think we've done more than uh, is necessary uh, relative to uh, trying to provide all the information possible. Our door is always open to, to talk through issues. Uh, I think some of the issues they've raised are um, related to the fact that they may not have all the details, but we have provided that uh, on a regular basis to respond to literally, I think, upwards of 100 communications over the last 18 months. Okay. Um, would you say that things are tracking better or worse in terms of the relationship or the degree of disagreement? Well, I, I, I'm, I, through you, Mr. Chair, I, I, I would say that from our viewpoint, um, it's, it is a little better. Um, I think there are some issues that Katapsa have and us may not agree on uh, relative to uh, some of their cost issues from a, the cost issues that I think are even flagged in the communication you just received this morning about our board costs. Um, we are in line with all boards for pension plans. We have a different system. We are a you know, two board system. A lot of pension funds have one board. It's, it was a structure set up by the province, so we're living within that. I can tell you that as, as, as a CFO of the City of Toronto, I look at costs. We have never had a, uh, an increase in my three years that has been, it's always been less than inflation, and that's it. Uh, I, I think all the costs that are absorbed within uh, the boards at OMERS are costs that are related to carrying out our function and ensure that we have the plan that you need. So from my perspective, all costs are valid and I would justify them to anyone. So I, I would, I respect that Katapsa is a group and it's not just one person with some, some ideas. It's, you know, somebody that, it's a group that comes with authority and speaking on behalf of a lot of people. Uh, could, would you summarize your prognosis for the future and the relationship as positive or negative? And, that, and that's really what I'm getting at. Is this going to be a problem that grows over time with, with criticism or static between the groups? Or do you think you're tracking somewhere, maybe very slowly, towards some, some positive outcome? From, from my perspective, it's a little better than it was when I first started uh, three, two, two and a half years ago. But we, we don't want to have this type of situation. Our door is open to try to solve it, and uh, I mean, this is the first time I've said it publicly, uh, and we're open to meet with Mr. Major and his staff at any time to try to solve these issues. Yes, um, so on page 16, where you say there's still more work to be done. The proof changes help address issues of fairness and equity within the plan. So my, my question is, um, where is the fairness and equity? Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, I, I was just told recently, which I was not aware of, that uh, your benef uh, beneficiary, if you're an employee, an employee of the city, that if you're a single parent and you have uh, uh, children, that they're not entitled to receive your pension and actually you do not receive the pension that you paid, that you have paid into. Is that correct? To you, Mr. Chair and Councillor, I, I want to clarify some information that I, I just gave you earlier. Um, the, the key categorization and, and uh, marker, if you will, for determining the eligibility for children to be your beneficiary pre-retirement, post-retirement. So the important piece is if that is designated as the beneficiary, if the child or children are designated pre-retirement, that's no problem. The issue becomes after the fact, after retirement, if there's a change being requested by a member, then there are issues with that because our plan uh, is based on as you retire and what you define as you retire pre-retirement. But as I outlined, um, the board's looking at that post-retirement piece now to see about 
options for the future because the situation you're describing, while you know, pre-retirement is no problem, post-retirement does happen and we literally met and discussed this issue last week at the board. Um, so we are looking at options for post-retirement. But the basics are prior to your retirement, you make that designation of a child or children, no problem. After retirement, then it becomes more complicated. So if you're a single parent, you're able to, yes. to your child yes. is able to, because I, I, I was told I was speaking to some um, uh, from the police services, um, that they're on police services, and they inform me that in fact that's not the case. So they're under the same plan as we are. So I just wanted to clarify that because if it's not the case, then it's there's no fairness. The important de yeah. uh, designation is pre-retirement versus post. Other questions from members on the presentation? No, okay, I had a couple. Um, so I just wanted to ask, so um, from my notes in 2016, um, you kind of had three pillars. One was OMERS was going to be 98% funded. Uh, OMERS investment strategy was going to average 7 to 11%. Uh, the two boards were going to be actively monitoring expense ratios of management. And then the next one was a next generation uh, pension administrative platform. I was just wondering. That, that sounds familiar. It, it aligns with those four pillars that I uh, highlighted, but with more specifics from 16. I think we basically met all those targets. I mean, the 7 to 11, of course, depends on, um, you know, the fiscal situation of the year, as highlighted by David. Uh, we didn't hit that in 2018 because of the uh, markets, but we more than exceeded it in 2016 and 17. Um, in terms of the operations cost, um, my recollection is we've actually gone down in our ratio of, of, uh, of costs uh, to, to assets in, in 2016, 17, et cetera. Um, the third one, Councillor, was... Um, and that's, that's one I also... Of course, question. the funded ratio you know, the 98 was the target and we're at 97. So it's the, the, the important funded funding ratio is still on the up, uptick and headed toward 100%. I think our, our biggest concern is sooner or later there's gonna be another recession. We're beyond 10 years and, and that's the issue is, um, you know, as I highlighted in that one slide, Councillor, once, once we hit another recession, that 98% will fall uh, are, we're prepared for it as best we can, um, but we want, and we don't see it as dramatic a drop as has happened in the past, and that's due to our expert staff managing that, um, but that's the, that's the pressure. Okay, and then um, I guess in terms of the investment mix or um, your staff, in when they're looking at an investment, would you characterize the OMERS investment policies as aggressive or passive? I'll turn uh, to David. Sorry? I'll turn it over to David. Okay, and I only asked that because there was an article last week The it talked about the Canadian Pension Plan Investment Board in uh, the Globe and Mail and it, it outlined, they, they were considered aggressive. Uh, it says, you know, um, for example, in the past 12 years, they've increased their asset base by $50 billion. So I would, I would neither, um, we certainly do not have a passive investment policy and we don't have an aggressive one. Given the maturity of the plan, it has to be a prudent, carefully managed one. It focuses on meeting that return threshold of seven, eight, nine percent. The CPPIB has a dramatically larger proportion of equities. And as a result, in December, they would have been hit much harder than we were. In our fixed income, we have a lot of assets that yield 5%. Whether the equity market goes up or down, that third gives a very steady yield. The same thing occurs in a number 
of our private assets, principally being uh, Oxford Properties and the infrastructure portfolio. That's power, utilities, pipelines, bridge tunnels, tolls. It's a very steady, stable um, annuity stream of cash flows. So I would say that our investment policy on the whole is moderately conservative, uh, and it is certainly not aggressive like CPPIB. Okay, and you would certainly, but you wouldn't refer to it as passive either. No, passive refers to um, some sort of market benchmark, whether it's 60-40 equities and fixed income, or it matches um, indes indices with some kind of ETF investment. We quite actively pursue and have been very successful both on the public and the private side investments. So it's an active investment policy but it is moderately conservative. Okay. Um, the other question I, I raised it last year as well is the the board expenses. The two the expenses of the two boards combined. The reading I was doing it's well over four million dollars, four point three million dollars to run the two boards, and it doesn't seem to have gone down since last year. So, Joe mentioned earlier our bicameral board structure is the product of legislation. We, we cannot change it, we cannot rationalize it, we can't eliminate the two boards. That was legislation from the Ontario. I'm not asking to eliminate them, I'm just asking about the within, expense to run two boards. With, within the boards, my, there's far less travel from my personal perspective. Uh, I do not travel, my net expenses last year were about $36 in parking. Um, there are some members that come from Ottawa, London, Kitchener, whatever, and, and they will travel. But any conferences, any expenses in that regard have been dramatically reduced over the last six years. And just to supplement further, <coughs> Councillor, I'm on the audit committee, and believe me, I go over the budget for the boards uh, with a fine tooth comb. And there is no excess spending there. It basically is for the board members. And we did have consulting fees required for that comprehensive review last year with all kinds of detailed modeling that we spoke to a year ago. Um, that's, that's now passed. Um, but the bottom line is minimal staff. In fact, I would argue, you know, very low threshold with staff supporting a board, uh, and we ensure that those costs do not go up dramatically. As I said earlier, they are in the range of one to two percent a year the, for the last couple of years, uh, and, and we're containing them. You know, I, I would try to, we always have an objective of reducing, um, but at this point in time, given all the reviews we're doing, and mainly because of some consulting costs that, that are necessary, uh, rather than hiring staff to do uh, those type of uh, third-party reviews. So I, you know, I really do stand behind the expenses that are there. Uh, I, I know they may sound high, but relative to other pension plans, believe me, they're not that high. And again, it all falls back to a two-board structure that was set up by the province. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. Um, and just the last area I wanted to touch on uh, was women on your boards and your management team. Um, and this got drawn to my attention in March. There was an article about Omer's Ventures expanded into Europe, and it talked about all the financial backing they had um, from different institutions, which was great. But then the author of the article uh, went out of his way to point out that Omer's had hired a woman, a Ms. Reeves, uh, and made her partner, and she was one of the rare partners in the industry. So I'm just trying to understand uh, from my perspective, I think Omer should be leading in that area. I'm just trying to understand. I see the chart there. The women consist of, there's three different categories, but I'm trying to figure out where you are in being more active in hiring management, women in senior management positions. I'll, I'll start off and then Michelle can expand. But uh, the, 
thing that I forgot to highlight on that slide is that in our 2030 strategy, and I should highlight, um, Mr. Chair, that uh, within a week, our updated 2030 strategy will be out. It was just approved by the board last month. Um, in that strategy, we are have a priority action on diversity and equity. Um, it wasn't as pronounced as it was in the past, and it, it is now a, a, a key driver in terms of our future for OMERS. Um, you saw the article with the appointment that was made by Blake um, in, in the UK, and I'll just turn it to Michelle to expand on the initiatives happening today. Good morning, Michelle. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. So further to Joe's comment, OMERS is committed to fostering an inclusive workplace and, and enhancing and deepening diversity of thought, and, and that includes women across our organization. Um, just to take you back in time a bit, in 2015, we created and, and established the Inclusion and Diversity Council, which is a global representation of, of, of some of our executives. Our CEO is the executive sponsor, and that is, you know, that was created to focus on enterprise-wide initiatives around inclusion and diversity. In 2018, we reestablished our Women at OMERS Employee Resource Group, which has um, an, hundreds of our employees globally focused on, on efforts to, to promote and advance women in the organization and to ensure an environment where they can be successful. We celebrate International Women's Day. Uh, and we do a number of things to focus on how we develop our women in, in the organization. Um, and so when I think about 2018, we had almost 50% of our hires to our, our global enterprise, so about 250 individuals, 250 women were hired, almost 50%. Of our promotions, we promoted 130 women across the organization, almost 50% there as well. And so we are making concerted effort there's no finish line here, and so um, we're focused on it as part of our people strategy, as Joe mentioned. Okay, so do you have a, do you have a number on, so the, the comment in the article that was, so when you looked at venture capital firms, uh, only 12% of the partners were women. So do you have a goal at OMERS of, do you have any idea how many women are partners right now, and what your goal is in terms of hiring more women as partners? So at the director level, so at our leadership team level across OMERS, we are at 33%, which is what's noted in the presentation. Um, I don't have the, the numbers in terms of you know, tech venture organization specifically. Um, at the executive level, we're at 27%. So we need to focus on increasing that. Um, and so we're doing that in a number of ways, as I mentioned, including building our talent pipeline internally. So how do we bring in uh, new new individuals and develop them through through uh, their time at OMERS. Okay, all right, thank you very much, appreciate it. Um, no further questions, so I wanna thank everybody for coming in this morning, appreciate the update, uh, looking forward to seeing you again next year. Thank you for all your hard work and your diligence. Uh, I just have a motion that we're gonna, yep, so I'm just amending, so this staff recommendation, is this, uh, the committee received this for information, I'm just amending it that uh, it goes to city council for information, I think it's important that all of our colleagues see this information as well. Questions of member? All in favor? Carried? All right, our next item, sorry I'm buried under paperwork here. There we go. Uh, our next item is number three. It was a timed item for 945 that recommendation number one be replaced with the following. The General Government Licensing Committee approved the individual tax appeal applications made pursuant to Section 323 of the City of Toronto Act 2006, resulting in tax deductions excluding phase-in and capping amounts outlined in the detailed hearing report, marked as Appendix A, excluding the following applications. Do I have to read these? Um, All right, and they're displayed on the screen. <laughs> Did you have questions, Stephen, or Councillor Holliday? Sorry, my apologies. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, could you just explain why we uh, why we're replacing the staff? I, I, I see a, a, an address on in my ward, for instance. So why do we? Why are we replacing the staff recs? 
Uh, generally, it's so if there's been an issue with the the property, it's my understanding. If there's been, can the lawyers explain it better? <laughs> uh, so, Councillor, generally speaking, those are seeking additional information or or uh, continuing to work through an application process uh, and. If the process were completed, it would come forward in the next year. I, so if I, if through you, Mr. Chair, I guess this question of you, it, this is a technical requirement from the staff and it's, I'm sure they're working diligently right up until the committee meeting and this is what needs to be done. Understood. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Sorry, Councilor Kerry Jans, did you have a motion? Uh, I do have a motion. I have some questions of staff. On okay. my mo sorry, on the item, okay. Okay, Councillor Karajanis, questions of staff. Uh, thank you, Chair. For you to staff, uh, I circulated in advance um, a, um, a picture, and that picture is of 125 Milner. That is in Scarborough, just north of the Scarborough Civic Center, and it's a popular, um, uh, I would say, it was a popular destination for everybody that wanted to play soccer or it was a, a dome. That dome came down uh, due to a natural catastrophe. I was wondering through you, Chair to staff, is there something that addresses um, in our bylaw uh, means of, uh, for this thing to come up again? Now, what happened in this, in this instance is that the, the owner of the dome has to put in a uh, a permanent structure because the insurance has advised them of such. Is there a means of us of addressing uh, the fees that we, he will have to pay uh, in view that this was a catastrophe and he's looking to put up the building again? Or is the act silent? Through you, Chair, uh, to the Councillor, the, the current uh, sections of the uh, City of Toronto Act deal with property taxes in these circumstances, but not the other fee implications. Sorry, I'm sorry, I, have, I, I, I just have difficulty hearing. Can you please repeat that? Uh, certainly, uh, through the chair, uh, the current sections 323 and 325 of the City of the Toronto Act deal with the property tax implications in circumstances where, uh, for example, as you described, a natural catastrophe has taken place, but not the other fee implications. So if we needed to address, let's say, for him to... Uh, to, to put up this uh, this structure again, but in a more, in a, a uh, but in, like in a steel uh, capacity, uh, and he needs to pay building fees. This is something that could be addressed and looked upon and, and waived since this was a natural catastrophe. Sorry, Councillor, could you repeat? <laughs> Thank you. Through through the chair to uh, to the uh, to uh, the staff. Is there something in our buildings department that addresses the uh, issuance of a building permit and, and waives it due to the fact that this was a natural catastrophe? Uh, through you, Chair, to, to the Councillor, we would have to work with the buildings department to ascertain that issue and revenue services would take their direction. And this is something that you can look at and report back in, in due time? Yes, Councillor. Would uh, Q3 uh, of this year be something that you can report back to us? That's reasonable, Councillor. Thank you very much. Any other questions uh, staff on this item? Thank you. No? Okay, so I have the motion before us. All in favor? Carry. Sorry, speakers, right? Sorry? Oh, you want to speak? Yes, oh, all right. I, do, I did give the, uh, I did give staff a, a motion to draft. Okay. Motion to reopen. All in favor? Councillor Karajanis. Thank you, Chair. If the staff have the motion ready, if they can put it up, I would appreciate it, please. Thank you, Chair. This is something that I worked with staff in order to draft. Uh, what happened at 125 Milner? Uh, there was a catastrophe. 
uh, due to natural uh, to, uh, to causes, uh, and the um, and the bubble came down. Thank God that uh, nobody was inside to get hurt. However, as they're trying to rebuild it, they've come along some uh, along some obstacles, and those obstacles are building permits, green roofs, and everything else. And I was wondering, uh, I've been talking to staff if they can look at this and come back to Q3, I believe, in order for us to make sure that such acts in the future are, um, uh, are there's, some, there's something in our City of Toronto Act that will speak to it. Councillor Holliday, questions of the mover? Thank you. Just for my benefit, could, uh, through you to the councillor, could I get a stronger definition of natural catastrophe, just so I understand? Acts of God. Okay. Um, fire, maybe. Okay, I mean, this so is, a fire? I mean, fire, earthquake, uh, natural, natural catastrophe. I mean, I, I would leave it up to staff to... Hail, locust. Hail, well, well, I mean, this is. I mean, this was able to, to handle hail, uh, Councillor Ainsley. But what happened is that the uh, note fall to uh, to the mechanism. The whole thing just came down very fast. Okay. So, so we're talking natural catastrophes, and, and let the staff address it. But I want to go beyond just the. You want to have the, a, the picture, but so is this saying like if a building is damaged by hail, that we examine the fees associated with that by the city? So. If a building, if a building comes down because of hail, and they need to, or a natural catastrophe, and they need to rebuild it, it there, our bylaw right now is silent in building permits and, and okay. additional fees. So, if a building burns down, you want to look at the fee structure around that versus the fee structure of building a brand new building. Uh, same, same concept. I just, I just want to understand what you're asking for. Well, you know, like I, I'm particularly. Focusing in on this uh, on this building. Understood. Uh, but if staff want to extend um, and take a look at other things, by all means, I have absolutely no problem. But this is to address this particular building that came down because of uh, uh, a, a catastrophic uh, uh, moment in Mother Nature, and the owners are trying to reestablish and put it up. And our um, our bylaws are silent. So, Councillor, I'm just, I'll get right to the chase on it. Are, are you looking to arrange for a fee reduction for owners that have had a natural disaster on their building? Yes. Okay, yes. I understand. Thank you. I mean, if somebody, if I just may add, Chair, if there's a landslide and the building comes down and then they want to put the building up, and if they go to the building department, the building department says, look, you got to pay for a building permit all over again, but the cause that the building came down was a natural disaster for that, for that fee to be waived. Okay, any other questions of the mover? And then, so Councillor Kerjanis, uh, we're just gonna hold this item down, committee members, because the lawyers need to look at your motion. Okay, I mean, some... this motion is something that I had staff help me draft, but certainly. Okay, the lawyers need to see it. Okay. All right, so we're gonna hold this item down. Our next item is uh, GL 6.6, 2018 Consulting Service Expenditures, City Divisions and Agencies and Corporations. Councillor Fillion, you held it down? Uh, yes, just a couple of questions. I'm not sure any, whoever you think you should direct them to. Um, I guess my concern is it's um, I don't have statistics on this, but I get the impression that um, some of the consulting we do is it's not the case that we don't. Um, I can understand the stuff where we need the external expertise and it's, um, it's kind of a one-off, but there are some things where we seem to hire consultants that um, maybe aren't that, uh, more in the softer services like designing parks or, um, I, I don't know, um, in the, um, anyway, if someone could address that, the, uh, the uh, veracity of the statement that we mainly hire consultants for short-term technical expertise. Was there a particular 
area or you just want an overall answer? Overall answer, yeah. Through the chair, um, the term consultant is probably used quite widely, but when it comes to the, this report, the consultants are um, firms that have been hired to provide advice to management to make decisions. Um, I would contrast that against something like parks where, they're, where they hire a consultant to help develop designs for the park. Those are, diff those are more of a professional service to assist them in the uh, creation of the construction project, not a consultant who is helping them make a management decision. Okay, so this is what's reflected here is only to help make a decision? Yes, that's correct. Okay, and um, I notice uh, that there are large increases in um, a couple of areas, like for example, I'll, I'll just go to table 1A, I won't try to take us through this whole report, but under um, um, agencies and commissions, creative communications looks like it uh, more than doubled. Um, Management R and D more than doubled. Any reason for that? Uh, through the chair, uh, councillor, uh, there's two predominant uh, sources where the increase is taking place: is Toronto Police Service and and Toronto Transit Commission, uh, and they're they're specific individual contracts that uh, are are for the current year. Well, the term, for example, creative communications, what does that refer to? So that's, that's a category of particular type of, uh, uh, of consulting. Um, go ahead, Steve. Through the chair to the councillor, uh, the definition of creative communications is provide advice and recommendation on advertising, promotions, public relations, and design which requires expertise and time that is not available by city staff. And so why would that have doubled? That doesn't seem related, for example, to Toronto Police Service. Through the chair to the councillor, there was a communication related projects uh, with the police, and we itemized that, I believe, on page. Page eight and nine of 11. Page eight, of the page eight and nine, yes. Of the appendix? Yeah, sorry, could you just point out to me what you're referring to? In the, uh, the text, it says the 2.5 million increase is due to the following initiatives. Uh, Toronto Police Services had 1.2 million increase in the following areas. Uh, that was mostly to the policing effectiveness and modernization or PEM projects as envisioned by the Transformation Task Force and the Way Forward Report. So there was a mix of communication strategies in the consulting engagements. So how much did Toronto please pay on consultants for um, communication strategy? I'm just looking right now. And some of this, I, I know we have a really busy agenda and I don't want to hold up the committee, so um, perhaps if no one else has any questions or concerns, I can do this offline and if necessary, if I had anything further to add, do it at council, but um, I don't want to hold this up with such a busy agenda. Through the chair, we'll, we'll try to do this before council if it, uh, and that might help Councilor Pillion. Yeah, or I'll just okay. talk to somebody in between okay. now and then. Okay. My concerns are fairly broad. I don't have really good examples of it. So I probably need to have a conversation, which I didn't have time to do before this meeting. Thanks. I can answer. Councillor, do you want to hold this down for now? No, I don't. Not, not Does anybody else have questions on this? Councillor Nunziata. Okay, so just, just one question. So th there has been an increase of $3.7 million in consulting fees for this year. So the, the increase in the consulting fees, were they allocated in the, in, uh, the division's uh, individual budgets? Were they included? Uh, 
Uh, through the chair to you, Councillor, generally speaking, the, the city divisions. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Generally speaking, through the city divisions, the actual uh, consulting increase has gone down. The increase is uh, related to agencies and, and corporations. Right. Uh, in, but in those cases, the allocation has was part of the budgeted increase. So it was included as part of as part of their budget. So you're yes, just Councilor. giving us uh, the itemized list now. That's right. That's correct. Thank you. Okay. Other questions of staff? Okay. Councillor Fillion, did you want to move the recommendations? It's receipt. Okay. All in favor of receipt? Carried. Uh, our next item is number 12, Councillor Nunziata, insurance claim trends against the City of Toronto and mitigation measures to reduce claims. Uh, can I just hold that down a few minutes because I'm waiting for motions. Sorry? I'm waiting for motions. Okay. Can I hold it no problem. Down? Uh, we'll hold that number 12 down. Number 13 is 2018 final report on property sales, acquisitions, expropriations, and leases. Councillor Holliday. Questions of staff? I do, and I, I'll keep them general because as you had uh, advised the committee that if we went too deep on it, we would have to go in camera because of the nature of the transactions. But I just wanted to confirm what was before us. Is it an information report or are we looking deeper on this? It's, uh, through the chair, it's more of an information report as these authorities have already been executed through the 2018. Uh, calendar year, so we're reporting on the authorities uh, that we received during that time. So I, I have a particular concern over an item that's in my ward. Um, see if I can get the, the approximate address. It doesn't. It's just still th theoretical either way. Uh, Eglinton Avenue. I think there's 4,200, 4,400, 42 something on. The, it's in one of the appendices. Yep. They're along the north side of Eglinton, and I know that, uh, let's say, Bill 107 that Councillor Matlow brought up on transportation uh, in the vicinity of the city could impact the, I guess, properties that have been delegated to create TO. So as a councillor, you know, what do I do when I see some concerns? I've got properties on the list. Um, maybe something that was decided back in 2012 might not be the right decision at this point in time. Um, is there a process? I mean, you brought the report to me as an information item, but what do I do with the information? Is there any advice on uh, you've got for councillors here that are reading this report on, on how to make the best use of what we got in front of us? Uh, through the chair, the property that you're referring to on Eglinton was um, held for the purposes of transit. So we weren't supposed to move on it uh, through the creative world in the sense of uh, looking for opportunities to do city building. Um, we are currently looking in on that property to see if it's still required for um, transit purposes uh, because along the Eglinton was uh, the Eglinton ex um, crosstown happening. So we were not to do anything with respect to those properties because we didn't know the impacts that those properties would have with the project itself. I'd say we still don't know because we don't know exactly what the plans are there. But that doesn't say that in the report. All it said was active and it was on a list of a whole bunch of other properties. So, so how do I or members of the public know that it's been held to make sure that we don't build or sell something um, and have it become a conflict? Do I need a motion out there or do, uh, do have you already got that motion or are you just proceeding prudently? I would say um, that staff are aware of the environment of the work that's being um, related to those properties and we are taking that into consideration whenever we're making decisions around how that property's future intended use is to be. If I, if I wanted to put council's weight behind, uh, would, it, would, it be a, would it be a motion in order on this report or is there some other way that I would need to do it? I think those are the principles staff are working through when it comes to properties and the impacts that they have with respect to how we're delivering um, the end result. So it's part of our, our work program and our day-to-day -day management of those assets. Um, these properties would then still make a circulation through the local councillor 
for that dialogue uh, whenever it is referred to a city build exercise or a disposition exercise. Um, this was an exercise just to identify that this property is to be um, brought forward to our strategic arm of Creatio to look at what other opportunities this property can lend itself from its current form to a future form. So I guess the last thing I would say is the, the right hand column says active on those particular properties. Are there any other choices for what to fill in that column with besides active, like on hold or under consideration? Yeah, the, I think um, through the chair, the active is that it's a city piece of property uh, that has an opportunity for us to look at future opportunities. Um, and that's where that column just uh, speaks to. It doesn't uh, mean anything beyond that um, definition of staff are working on that property and are looking for what future opportunities could be potentially there. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Holliday. Other questions of staff? Councillor Fillion? Yeah, uh, I guess a question for Mr. Simos. Um, as you know, um, we often have uh, development applicants who wish to purchase city property, whether it's a laneway or a parking lot or a, or a lot that's adjacent to their um, land assembly. Um, and in uh, the area I represent, we um, never complete those sales, um, or those sales are conditional upon council approving their application. How um, uniform is that practice? across the city? Uh, through the chair, whenever lands become available to, um, to create a land assembly opportunity, we look at it at its highest and best value as it participating as part of that development. Um, it is our, at our own sole discretion of whether the city would like to dispose that asset to allow for that type of development to occur. Um, those consultations are made through the local councillors, sometimes uh, city council, um, and staff to understand what is and how the city land is going to be participating in that environment. So um, I, I, I won't give the exact location of the example I'm going to use because we're in public session, but um, um, in the last term of council, we had uh, I can think of at least one example, I'm sure there was more than this, of the of city real estate selling a parcel of land to someone who was uh, putting together a development application. Um, they uh, subsequently appealed to the Ontario Municipal Board, the, the city, city council and planning was not in favor of their application. Um, but they had our land and um, um, our land by the time it went to the Ontario Municipal Board because of the land assembly would have been worth considerably more than they paid for it. How do we, so in that example, um, the city lost out two ways in the value of the land, the, the sales value of the land and in um, getting a good planning uh, result. So I, uh, am I hearing that that's kind of up to the local councillor, whether we do, how we go about those things? Well, through the chair, in our agreements of purchase and sales, we define in how the property it's going to be used as part of the development. So um, the mechanisms that we may use to uh, manage those expectations are through stratified interests, where we put a cap on what we believe um, is the appropriate uh, participation of our property in that development. Um, and in turn, if something greater is to be achieved and we agree with the greater amount, we will then receive the difference in funds from what we had agreed to with that invisible line um, on the stratified interest versus what um, we may agree on the future use of that land on a greater uh, stratified interest. So I guess what I'm trying to find out is the extent to which we might need a policy that would <coughs> kind of cover the whole city to protect the city's interests and um, perhaps that's a, another uh, offline conversation unless there's a simple answer. 
through the chair, I don't believe there's a simple answer to that request. Okay, thank you. So rather than rather than holding it down today, I think I might wish to talk to staff and work on a motion for council, unless you'd rather I hold it down. So I, I would I'd like to actually have a conversation with Councillor Fillion and the team, and then we can decide how we would proceed. Sure, okay, thank you. Other questions of staff? Seeing none. Um, so I wanted to ask on in Appendix B, maybe this is to Nick Sanos. Um, so in Appendix B, number seven, 4086 Shepherd Avenue East, and it's part of a ramp. How many parking spots are on that lot? Going off from memory, I think about 90 parking spots that we're going to be incorporated within that piece of property. Um, but that property ownership surrounding it was um, owned by Metrolink, so our lands would participate in creating that complete parking facility. Sorry, say that again? So the lands that we um, disposed of in this situation where we sold to Metrolinx, uh, they owned lands as well. So this would form part of a greater uh, land assembly that would create parking um, for the entire um, station over there. So our, our contribution to it was approximately, I believe, 90 parking spots. So, so the lot that we're, they're proposing to buy from us has 90 parking spots and we're also selling the ramp to them, which, sorry, for lack of a better word, so we own the ramp to their parking lot. The, the ramp, um, it's not a ramp to a parking lot, it's the ramp that's at the grade separation that happened along Shepherd, um, and those were lanes that were along the side of it. They're, they're not used for, um, there's no use for them, they're, they're green space. Um, their landscape lands. The ramp is a green space? The, the ramp that's referred to as a ramp is the ramp that was the great separation along. Okay, so it's like the side of the hill. It's the side Shepherd. of the hill, exactly. Okay, so and we have, uh, so 90 parking spots and we're proposing to sell it to them for $2.2 million. So hypothetically, could they come along and decide to, to flip that property to a developer and put you know, a 12-story condo. Councillor Karajanis could probably speak to this more, it's on Shepherd, but put up a 12-story condominium, put the parking lot underneath the building, sell the air rights. Once we dispose property, um, the landowner has the opportunity to, to take that piece of property and, and um, decide to repurpose it. Um, our planning framework allows and our zoning framework allows for that and what to happen there. But hypothetically speaking to your situation, they could ask for an application to do a development on the site. And what's the, the maximum height there that a developer could come in right now and put a condominium on that piece of property? I'm not aware of what the, the actual heights are on that site, but right now the part of the the piece of property is being used for parking purposes, they would have to come up with a development application of which then it would have to go through the planning process to achieve uh, what, what that suggested application may uh, request. No. No. And was this put on the open market? Uh, no, it was not put on the open market. These lands um, were adjacent to lands that were owned by Metrolinx. The only party that would have value to these lands because of the fact that the ownership is broken up in pieces there would be Metrolinx um, because of them being an adjacent owner. Um, that the surrounding land, the way that it was comprised of included city lands and Metrolinx lands. But it's not broken up if we have a piece of property that's the, it's a parking lot equivalent to 90 spots on Shepherd Avenue. It services the GO train station there, the Agent Court GO train station. Um, so it, it's, it's part of an entire parcel of land that is owned by Metrolinx and there's a component of it that was owned by the City of Toronto. Okay, all right, thank you. Any? Councillor Kerjanis, you have questions? Thank you, thank you Chair. This is the old Canadiana Hotel that uh, 
we're selling to Metrolinx at the Agent Go station, would that be correct? Correct. So this uh, was the, the land was something that was already, yeah, I believe, uh, we looked upon and we had an independent auditor do a, a, a price that it would be feasible for us to sell it to Metrolinx? Correct. We do an independent appraised value of which uh, the values determine what the highest and best use of that. Um, and we had come up to a rate. And if I'm not mistaken, this is something that uh, myself as the local councillor and staff went through and matter of fact, or something is a debate in the, in the council upstairs and we agreed that the price was fair? Very diligently, we went through the price. If we're good. Sorry, we're good. You're good with this? Okay with this, yeah. Really? Okay. <coughs> Sorry? Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, other questions on this item? <coughs> Councillor Matlow? I, uh, I was left confused after uh, Councillor Ainsley's questions were answered. Um, so to clarify, of the entire site, how much does Metrolinx already own? How much do we own? You said it was in parcels, but it's all used as a lot. So could you just kind of put the puzzle together for us? So the lands that we sold to Metrolinx were formed part of the larger Agent Court station. This was a component of the lands that formed that station. So it wasn't as if we sold them the entire parcel of lands that makes the station itself. It was a part of multiple parts that create the station, the complete station itself. But would there be enough room on the land that we own for a developer to eventually build? Is the footprint large enough to be able to build a condo? The footprint would actually break up the way that the station um, conducts itself with respect to its parking and access into the station itself. Um, so it's not as if it's a, a piece of property that's sitting off on the side that is forming it. It's, if I can show you an illustration of it, it it's, it's pretty much in the middle of it coming off of the street, uh, off of Shepherd Avenue. So are you, <clears throat> I mean, is, is, your, is your argument that it could only be worth something to Metrolinx for Metrolinx's purpose? Or, or as Councillor Ainsley was alluding to, could, is, it, is, it, is it possible that if Metrolinx obtains that property and then puts that piece of the jigsaw puzzle together with the rest of the property that they currently own, that they could uh, flip it around and, and, and do a development uh, project? Correct. So um, it was a requirement for their agent court station to be included as part of their parking facility, of which is where the request had come to the city for the um, ownership and the fee simple ownership with respect to that site. We explored um, long-term leases. We explored other mechanisms of, of providing that uh, property to them. Because of their investment within the transit uh, system, they require fee simple ownership so that they can um, invest in their assets and, and basically divest that through a period of time. Remember, like <clears throat> we're working with, uh, with and I mean, that's a provincial agency that is ostensibly a transit agency, but this government's stated goal is to redevelop uh, the properties along the transit lines. So could it, is it conceivable, is it, is it conceivable that we would be essentially, a, for, for a relatively low price, without knowing what the, what the, the value it could be, with any upzoning or, or you know, increased tighter density allowances, we'd be selling for a relatively low price to allow them to consolidate their property in a way that would be ready for some sort of transaction with a developer. It, it, would there not be an argument that could be made that we should hold on to that, await to see what they do, and then perhaps have the leverage to be able to obtain a better price at a time when we know uh, what their plans are? Um, through the chair, you could wait up to a certain point where they can take action against um, receiving that in a different form. And through our experience, they, if, um, if we were to negotiate 
uh, to a point where they would not be able to obtain that piece of property, they do have the opportunity to expropriate those lands for the purposes of delivering that transit program. So uh, to answer your question vaguely, you, you could try to find a solution there to hold on to those lands to try to participate um, through a, a larger or greater development down the line. But if that, uh, they also have a construction schedule that needs to be satisfied and they need to they, they couldn't legally uh, expropriate, expropriate the lands to pursue a condo development. It would have to be a stated goal to make a transit improvement, wouldn't right. it? Right. So this would be in support of providing parking for that transit improvement along Agent Court. Now, how they treat those lands going forward, um, they, they have the ability to do so. But at yeah. that point in time, they're doing it for transit purposes and they require full uh, Last question um, through you, your Chair. Would the, typically, would the, would the price that we would be provided through an expropriation be better or worse than the price that we are asking for today? The price that we achieved at that time is market value. And would we be provided a better price through expropriation? <clears throat> no, because the way that we value this piece of property would be at market value at its highest and best use of what the property is currently zoned for. And that's the price you would receive. Okay, thank you. Paul, I think John has another question. Um, and this is related to my other line of questioning, but the, where you have a situation where um, somebody says we want this for a, a parking lot and it's, you know, we value it as um, basically a parking lot or whatever its, it's underlying uh, zoning is, but we know that someone is likely to, whether it's Metrolinx or uh, private property owner at some point in time then use what they bought as a parking lot for something that is much more valuable. I think that's what the concern is. Is there not a way to cover that off with some kind of covenant or um, something else contained in the agreement? It's this price for parking lot, but should you ever sell this for something different than that, then it will be you will owe us X dollars. Through the chair, the property was sold at its highest and best use. Its current form is a parking lot, so the valuation um, may have taken into consideration the parking lot itself or the greater value of the highest and best use of what the property is capable of doing today. Um, with respect to putting in covenants on property that we uh, dispose of for future um, sure. options of of greater success within those lands because of how they're being repurposed. Um, that isn't a practice that we've uh, done and if we've done so, the, ch uh, the likelihood with the Perpetuities Act of being successful in receiving those funds at a later date are very challenging. Okay, well I'll include that in, in the conversations we're gonna have, thanks. Okay. Sorry, Councilor Karajanis, you had another question? Uh, yes, Chair, if I can have a second round, I appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, through you to staff, was there ever a, um, a study or did you ever look about um, having a, a building on that site? Um, have you contacted uh, planning to see if um, a building could be put or something that we can sell to a developer or come to some agreement with Metrolinx that we can certainly uh, put something on top of that, uh, uh, that piece of property that we own? At that time, um, I don't believe there was work done with respect to looking at future uses or proposed uses outside of the existing zoning. Uh, we did not undertake that exercise. If we were to undertake that exercise, would that um, uh, help back any uh, development that's done at Asia Court uh, uh, Met Go Station right now by Metrolinx? Um, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be able to help or create a, a greater value. Um, and the reason for that is because it was identified for a requirement for Metrolinx to carry out their project. They needed parking uh, stalls there to support the transit. And as I explained earlier, um, they have the ability to expropriate from the city if we do cause any delays to their program. So if we were to um, 
move something along the lines that says, look, we want to have another look at this, they can certainly move to expropriation. Would I be correct? Absolutely. And if they move to expropriation, would we be getting uh, the value that we ask for, or, or can we lose on what we have? Well, that value could be challenged uh, through the process, and we could receive, um, hypothetically, either less or greater, depending on what the outcome is. Is there a willingness uh, for city staff to um, have another look at this and negotiate uh, with Metrolinx to see if there could be uh, additional uses for the property that could be had uh, besides a parking facility? We could take a look at it. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, so we're done with questions to speakers. Okay, uh, so I have a motion that I'm gonna move. Uh, that the General Government Licensing Committee delete number seven, 4086 Shepherd Avenue East and part ramp from Appendix B and request the Acting Director of Real Estate Services to report to the General Government Licensing Committee at its meeting on October 7th, 2019 with options for utilizing this property for sale. Um, and so I'm doing this because I, I looked at first glance as I went through these properties and I did ask staff for an appraised value of the properties, which I can't go into because uh, we would have to go on camera. Um, but uh, it raised some concerns for me um, as I looked at this property in particular on Shepherd Avenue East and I don't want to dig too deep into Councillor Kara Giannis's uh, ward or upset his residents. Uh, I understand the needs of Metrolinx. I take the GO train back and forth myself uh, every morning, but I looked at this property and how we're trying to create a higher order of transit in Scarborough in particular. And we talk often about uh, the Shepherd Avenue subway. And I think that if we're gonna build the Shepherd Avenue subway, uh, further east into Scarborough, we need to be looking how to intensify the Shepherd Avenue and uh, not selling this property to Metrolinx for a parking lot. I look to look at what all of our options are. Um, often I hear talk about, you know, parking lots, put a condominium or intensify it, work out an agreement with the adjacent landowner for parking. Um, but I, certain, I think this is certainly a piece of property on this list that we need to look at more. Uh, so I'm porting this motion forward. Thank you. Councillor Karagiannis to speak. Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, I really appreciate uh, the work that all of us did on this, on this uh, matter. Uh, certainly this is something that um, can be looked upon. Uh, the, there's a lot of development that's happening right now for my colleagues along Shepherd. Uh, if you go from Shepherd and Victoria Park East, uh, you got Shepherd and Victoria Park you got a couple of buildings before pharmacy. There's three corners of pharmacy. You go Shepherd and Warden on the north side. Besides the Red Lobsters, there's a building going up. Uh, you go farther east on the south side, just past Warden. There's a, another um, uh, building going up, and you go along to uh, Bridgemount and Finch. Uh, sorry, Bridgemount and uh, Shepherd. Another possible building. Age Group Mall is coming to Community Council tomorrow with 4,100 units across the street at 4,002 Shepherd. More buildings to go up. Uh, in front of the Delta Hotel, right now, there's seven buildings on the top side. There's another six buildings, uh, three that have already been approved and three across the street. On card record, there's another five buildings, and I can go on and on and on. Certainly adding, um, looking at this, uh, this, uh, this would be certainly something that we can look at and uh, we can exercise our options and certainly work with Metrolinx to make sure that there's more, uh, be it affordable housing, be it a, a condo. I would prefer to have affordable housing at that site with the city and work with the developer in order to get it done. And I urge you all and uh, I, to support Councillor Ainsley's motion and I thank him for putting it forward. Conversation was said and I, I, I accept the fact that he's putting it forward and really thank him for it. So I strongly su suggest that we support Councillor uh, Ainsley's motion. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Other speakers? Seeing none, so. Sorry, you're speaking, Councillor Hall. I'm gonna have to, yeah, I guess you got a motion status. Metrolinx is just gonna grab it. Uh, Mr. Chair, I wonder if we could just hold this down while we just get a motion sorted out. Sure. In relation to an appendix, it should be fairly quick. Okay. 
we will hold it down. Uh, number f next one is number 14, real estate acquisitions, expropriation of property interests near the Christie subway station for easier access to phase uh, three project. Um, I held that down. Uh, questions of staff? And, I'll, and I can, so, sure. May I suggest we can actually sort of bundle both the Donlands and this item together because it's the same line of questions that I have, unless anyone uh, objects. Yep, I'm fine with that. Okay. 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 Uh, then my, my, questions? My, my questions of staff, uh, there, there is a, uh, there's a trend here today. Uh, the, the, the subject today is, uh, confusion uh, on the ground based on unilateral decisions by the province with respect to Bill 107 and the future of uh, the property assets and air rights along the uh, subway lines. So with respect to both Christie and, if you guys could just quite down, uh, Christie and Donlands uh, both, at this very moment, now I, I recognize that the object is accessibility and, and I, of course I, I strongly support the intent of, of the, these works. But at a moment where we don't know who is about to even own these properties uh, or, those, or the stations uh, or uh, have the responsibility to invest necessary capital dollars into improving accessibility. Um, and at a moment, for example, that we've halted work on the relief line because we don't know whose line is gonna be built and what line is gonna be built and who's doing it. Is this the moment that we should be spending city dollars to expropriate lands for easements when we don't know if we're even going to own it tomorrow? Should it possibly be the provincial government that does this work? I ask that question simply because we're in this very uh, chaotic moment of transition, possible transition. Through the chair, um, City Real Estate and the TTC are working alongside to um, to develop, sorry, to um, be able to ensure that the mandated uh, date of 2025 is reached when it comes to ar around AODA and fire and life safety and second exits are those that are part of it. It's a program uh, that's being um, planned by TTC. I appreciate that. Of which City Real Estate participates in that for the acquisition of the properties. And in order to achieve that date, these are the list of properties that have come through. That, that's not, uh, that's, that's lovely. Uh, and and, I, and I, I support doing that. That's not, that, that doesn't actually re reflect the question that I just asked. No matter our motivation, no matter our intent, no matter our goals, they're all lofty and critically important. That's not the question. The question is, no matter why we're doing it, is it logical to be investing city dollars into um, expropriations or other acquisitions for <clears throat> properties or even a, even a service perhaps that tomorrow we may not own or control? Um, in other words, what if, we, what if we acquire a property to do A and then find out tomorrow that we can't use that property anymore for easement, uh, an easement for, for the elevator access and then we're stuck with that property because we don't even, we don't even run the subway. Um, do, do you understand what I mean? We're sort of in this awkward moment. The chair, in the absence of not knowing what tomorrow is, uh, the business is continuing to operate, and for the for public safety and AOD and, and fire and life safety that I just described is being part of that program and compliance that needs to be uh, completed by 2025. We can't uh, stop that program itself uh, to wait for what tomorrow may bring when it comes to ownership and alignment of interest. Uh, on property or on how the transit uh, system will operate. That's a very reasonable response. <clears throat> but we are, for example, halting work on a number of other projects throughout the city, not knowing what's happening tomorrow, including the relief line, right? We were just told that at council last week. So um, there, there might be a diversity of opinion amongst uh, staff about sort of what we move forward with and what we don't. But 
given given the uncertainty and let's say your your argument is the way to go are there are there backup plans here like are there are there discussions being had has there been outreach amongst amongst us here at the city and TDC has there been outreach to uh, Metrolinx in the province about you know what their commitment will be to accessibility at our stations if we are to make these first steps there are greater discussions with respect to how the city and um, the TTC alongside the province are going to work through uh, the elements that they've brought forward uh, with respect to the bills that you've uh, you've brought forward to us and what's happening out there. Uh, we're working alongside them sharing information when it comes to property and the operations of the transit system. This system that the work is being uh, done is a live system where the relief line and other uh, systems that, to be as an example, are not live today. So this is why they're continuing to do that work with respect to uh, these two stations that you have in front of you. And then what would happen to that property if, this might be a little too hypothetical, but has there been some, has there been any discussion about if if we if we expropriated land to service an existing station and then we find out that we don't control the station by the time we want to utilize that land would we just put that back on the market or 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 or, or might it might that might that itself become property that would be taken over by the province through 107 i mean do we do we understand that yet no we don't not at this time we haven't gone to the granule um, element of understanding how each property itself servicing the TTC um, at this point in time will participate in any future discussions on uploading or the transit system. Okay. Thank you. Just so uh, to, the, to the chair, councilor, I, th I think your questions are, are important questions, but the one thing that is, is important right now is the work that we're trying to do on the transit file right now with TTC or whether it would be with Metrolinx is actually really critical to the public no matter how we look at it, no matter who's owning it, right? And those questions that you have, we're working through that and there's obviously a table that, that is working through the whole transit discussion, but I want to be really clear that this one is really critical. And I know you know that from an accessibility and AODA compliance. And we've got, they've got an actual, TTC has a huge program for the last so many years that have been working through that and there's many more of these that we'll, we'll be looking at throughout the, the next few years too but I know you know that I'll just I'll speak to it after you ask questions sure. uh, Councillor Filion uh, yes um, just regarding um, timelines I, I understand the need to start moving on this now so we would have something in place and for 2025, at what point are we financially committed? Uh, that is, can we start the process but not um, spend any money acquiring land or <clears throat> building anything until um, it's clear who who's going to own what? To the chair, without understanding what the end goal is um, and having clarity with respect to that, it's difficult to to answer that question and how much are we committing to this. I think at this point in time, uh, we're committing 100% to bring the program out uh, until such time that um, the changes that are there to happen uh, will then take these things into consideration. Yeah, well, I guess what I'm looking for is what point in time would we have to actually acquire the property that we would have committed ourselves to acquiring the property? I assume it's not immediately, so between now and, and then, how long a time are we looking at? So through the, um, through the, expo uh, sorry, through the expropriation process, it's roughly a year. So the, the commitment we're making here today is undertake that process, which is to receive those lands in the control of the city for the purposes of delivering this program. So we have, so up to a year from now, um, or something will come back to us at some point before we actually acquire it? Is there, could there be another report at which point we would make a final decision based on hopefully some clarity on, on who's going to own this piece of property? 
That would be f uh, formed as part of the larger discussion on how the city's assets will participate in the potential uh, upload or, or consideration on how the transit system is going to operate. Um, what you have here today is basically a process that we're undertaking in order for us to ensure those timelines are met. And those timelines, when you, uh, through this commitment here on the expropriation, would start uh, roughly a year from now. So you would not be able to make any adjustments towards that unless there's a greater um, decision made on how property is to participate as part of the larger uh, discussion on the transit. So, but could we, for example, not make a motion today that staff report back before um, actually acquiring the property? You could, it just it would delay the, the timelines with respect to achieving the second exit projects that you have in front of you. Well, how would, it, how would it delay it more than, how would it delay it? Because right now, um, the reports in front of you are in order for us to meet those timelines uh, based around the project expectations. Therefore, we're bringing the expropriation matter uh, forward so that we can commence that project and secure those dates. Sure, but, but I, I thought I understood that you could commence it then, but there would be up to a year where we could back out. So if we got a report in 10 months or something, how would that delay things unless we decide we don't want to purchase it? Correct. If we didn't want to proceed through the transaction, then we would be able to pull out of the transaction so that we didn't have to acquire that property given that, uh, from your example, if we knew 10, 10 months from now and we didn't buy that property, then we wouldn't execute on that part. So do we need a report? Do we need to make a motion today for that kind of a report back? Otherwise, it would just proceed? If we want that kind of a safeguard, do we need to make a motion today? I guess is my question. I don't, um, through the chair, I just, I, I wouldn't know how to treat the motion in the sense of trying to deliver the property in time for the, the project, because it could happen anywhere between zero and 12 months of that acquisition, depending on the, the settlement that, or the negotiations that we may have with each individual owner that would be impacted by this. So I wouldn't be able to tell you two or three or six months or 10 months from now that uh, we haven't spent any money on the acquisition of that piece of uh, line that we require. So it would make it challenging to, um, I, I don't even know, I wouldn't know how to manage that at that point if the, if the dates would always be in flux. Thank you. I have just, just, just a question on expropriation. It's, it's from my past experience. There's a huge process in expropriation. It takes approximately a year or more for that whole process to be completed, correct? The, the ownership in land comes to us within a year. The process itself on settling of funds um, could take longer than a year. So you to go through the whole process, you're talking a couple of years. To close the file yeah. could be a couple of years, but the, the ownership in the land would be received within the year. Yeah, okay, just wanted to. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Nunziata. Uh, questions of staff? Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry. Uh, Mr. Simos, I, I, I wanted to ask down in, the, uh, down in the weeds question. So number 14 and 15, so it's, they're both basically the same exercise you want to go through. So uh, in number 14, so number 15 has a confidential attachment with the the costs or the appraiser or the estimates, um, but the same is not done for number 14. I'm trying to understand why, or why we're expected to vote on one without any costing and the other one comes with costing. So for, sorry, for number 15, there's a confidential attachment that has um, an estimated appraised value that was done with respect to the properties that are being considered. Um, with respect to the um, 14, do you know? One is stage one. one. Okay, so one is stage one and the other one is stage two. So the reason why you would have with respect to um, 
an appraised value and a confidential attachment is because we're in stage two of the work. We're the first one. You don't have a confidential attachment because we don't, we haven't gone through stage one. This is stage one. So we'll provide the numbers at stage two. Two. So the Christie, uh, the intention to expropriate. so Christie subway sta station is the process to identify the expropriation, the where the other report is to carry through with the expropriation. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, speakers, Councillor Mallow. I have a motion uh, being worked on right now, but to paraphrase what it will end up being, along the lines of what Councillor Fillingham was asking for. Uh, for staff to uh, report to our committee before sort of that, that end date being to be able to pull out of the expropriation, but to ensure that there's no delay in the process. And I'm putting that word right in to, there to give you the assurance that this is not in any way uh, meant or even allowed to uh, get in the way of the process, but to make sure that we have a check-in at the necessary time. Also, it won't have a specific date, but it's just before, right? So now, the reason I do that and the reason I believe Councillor Fillion and I were in agreement and perhaps all of us is that in no way uh, was my line of questioning nor was Councillor Fillion's or anyone else's objecting to or questioning uh, the necessity of ensuring that every uh, station uh, throughout the system is fully accessible. In fact, I would argue that we have been uh, negligent uh, collectively uh, over many years uh, to be able to invest as quickly as we should have been in ensuring that every single station is uh, fully accessible. And I'm glad to see that we are getting on with the business of, uh, of ensuring that, uh, that public facilities like subways are uh, going to be uh, respectful and caring and uh, accessible to every uh, resident of Toronto. But the reason that we challenge uh, just the timing of all this is because of the really awful and unfair uh, circumstances that we found ourselves in with respect to unilateral uh, decisions of the provincial government about the future of these assets that we currently own to the TTC. And it puts us in a position of not knowing literally what will happen tomorrow. In fact, we hear announcements sometimes, not only day to day, but hour to hour, about uh, meaningful and impactful uh, decisions uh, that affect uh, the work we do every day at City Hall and at the TTC. So that's why, uh, that's why my line of questioning was, was as challenging in that respect. But I want to say, though, the answers to my questions, I, I have a lot of respect for for staff, for your, uh, for their uh, uh, responses, because what I heard, if I was actively listening to their responses, is that they don't want this uh, political reality that we're all facing to impede their ability to get the work done that I'm sure both their minds and their hearts are in, which is to uh, make our system accessible, uh, because people. People should have a right, literally a right, legal right, to have accessible uh, stations. Uh, so I, 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 I honor and I, and I respect uh, um, staff's um, unwillingness to uh, capitulate to the uh, realities uh, that we're facing. But they are realities that we're facing. And that's why I think this, this discussion is so important because we're struggling right now, whether it be about moving forward with accessible stations and whether it be about the relief line. I mean, um, you know, I, uh, one of the responses was that we're talking about active stations here, and that's different than uh, the relief line that has not been built yet. But it is an active uh, priority given the fact that there currently are uh, platforms on our network uh, that are overcrowded, uh, in particular Bloor Young, but you know going up in areas where I represent Davisville, uh, St. Clair, Eglinton, and then going north as well into North York. 
uh, and elsewhere that are that are you, you literally have to wait two or three trains to get on and and once you're on you're you're crammed in like a sardine there are people who who uh, have written to all of us suggesting that it is unsafe at times where they the crowding is so bad that they feel like they're almost pushed forward um, we have to address this yet we are halting plans to do a lot of things throughout our subway system and our transit network as a whole because uh, of the instability and, 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 the, and, the, and the unpredictability and the chaos that's been created by the provincial government. Um, Councillor Ainsley will know that, that there are residents, and Councillor Kerry Janice, that there are residents in Scarborough uh, who are now, because of the uncertainty uh, uh, because, and because of the antiquated RT system that they have now that's nearing, if not perhaps extended its, uh, its, uh, its life uh, span, are going to be stuck on the bus uh, for, for, for years uh, because of the, uh, the chaos that's been created. Whether you like RTs or subways, I mean, because of this chaos, that's what's, that's what's resulted. So we need, as a council, to get to figure out how far we want to go with investments into a system that, that literally tomorrow may not be ours. And that's, that's where the, the, this challenge is, uh, has come from. But I do appreciate that staff want to get on with the work of, uh, of making our stations accessible. I strongly support that. Um, but um, I, I do hope that there's always a plan B happening in the background as far as what if we lose control of uh, what we've invested in just the day before. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Fillion, did you want to speak? Nope. Anybody else wish to speak on this item? Nope. Councillor Matlow, your motion is good. There might be some adjustments. Okay, we're going to hold this one down. So we're just going to go back to. We're going to go back to number three. Cancellation, reduction, and refund of property taxes, June 24th, 2019 hearing. Councillor Karajanis' motion is ready now. Yes. Councillor Karajanis read his motion. Does he need to read it? Uh, no. Please. No. It's okay. I'm good with it, Chair. All right. And uh, I, just, I just want to thank staff for working with me on this issue. Uh, everybody concerned, and I, I do ask that you please support this motion. Okay, so we have uh, Councillor Karajanis' motion on the screen. You want to be recorded in the negative? Okay, so a recorded vote on Councillor Karajanis' motion. All in favor? Sorry? Councillor Fillion, Councillor Karajanis, Councillor Ainsley, Councillor Matlow, Councillor Nunziata, opposed? Councillor Holliday? And then we have the uh, amendment, the list, my motion that I read. All in favor? Carries unanimously. Item is amended. All in favor? Carried. Okay, that takes care of number three. Then we're back to number 12. Councillor Dunziata held it. She had a motion, I believe, is ready now. Sorry, you still have, you have questions? Okay, sorry, all right. Sorry, Councillor Nunziata, just before we go to questions, why don't we, Councillor Holliday held number 13 and had a motion, which should be ready. Okay. I can just read and explain very quickly. So, yep. uh, uh, like Councillor Ainsley's motion, I just wanted to get an update to the Appendix, um, and in particular, item six and seven on that are addresses on Eglinton Avenue West that are close to the edge of the road, and there's uncertainty around the future of those parcels because of the transit announcements. And I just want to make sure that the table is updated to reflect that because right now they say active, and I think it's important to make the point and to the point that anyone in the area that is familiar with what's going on to Eglinton, there's a lot of sensitivity around those lands and I got some answers in the questions that no one is 
rushing ahead uh, with plans on those areas because they know that there's overlap and complexity with what's happening um, with transit planning. So it's just a simple request that we get those um, those particular line items updated and I think the uh, the ward number needs to be updated as well. Hope you'll support that, thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Holliday. Uh, so we have that motion, all in favor? Sorry, is there any questions on this motion? Seeing none, all in favor? Carried. Then I have my motion, all in favor? Carried, item is amended, all in favor? Carried. Okay. Sorry, is the... Sorry, I just wanted to ask with the committee's indulgence, so it's a quarter after 12. Um, we have two items, uh, so there's one deputy for number 25, one deputy for number 27. Does the committee want to hear those two deputants and then we'll go back to those items later? So then they don't have to sit through lunch and come back and, is that okay with everyone? All right, okay. Uh, so uh, we're gonna hear, uh, we have two deputants. The first one, uh, Derek Moran on number 25, increase in penalty amounts uh, for, afternoon Derek, how are you? This is yours, isn't it? Councilor Anderson. So Derek, so this is the increase in penalty amounts for stopping and parking violations. Mm -hmm. So Derek's gonna make his presentation and then we'll come back to this item later. I just wanna say by me speaking at this meeting, this shall not be deemed to be in any way my consent expressed or implied and doing so is fraud. God bless Her Majesty the Queen and long live Her Majesty the Queen. And let the record show I do not consent to the unconstitutional searches violating Section 8 of the Constitution Act 1982 that are currently taking place here at Toronto City Hall as the province has never given the City of Toronto express statutory authority to do this. I just want to take a moment to thank both Councillor Ainsley here and Councillor Nunziata for the support they showed to me at the end of the recent North York Executive Committee in support of freedom of expression guaranteed by Section 2B of the Constitution with their act of civil disobedience towards Mayor Tory and clapping along with me when the Mayor adjourned the meeting. So at the police board, I've mentioned before, there's a, a police officer's manual um, by uh, Gary P. Rodriguez. And in the police officer's manual, it mentions something about called the uh, Law of Nations. And I have section 132 from uh, book two of the Law of Nations here. And it says, uh, the opinion of the Burgrave of Nuremberg deserves to be mentioned. God, said he, has created heaven for himself and his saints and has given the earth to mankind, intending it for the advantage of the poor as well as of the rich. The roads are for their use and God has not subjected them to any taxes. So that's gotta be kinda awkward to realize now that you're violating the law of nations and disobeying the word of God and improperly applying the law. Do you remember the, um, the bicycle cop, Kyle Ashley on Twitter? I saw him on Twitter one day, he was mocking someone he gave a ticket to, and I thought, hey, yeah, that's really funny. So I asked him a question, and Councillor Carroll was actually in, in this thread. And the question was simply, if Ontario is a common law jurisdiction, then aren't you defrauding these people by going around and charging them with Roman municipal civil law violations? And he gave me a bunch of snarky comments, but I kept on at it with the question. And you know what, he never answered it. You know what he did do instead? He blocked me on Twitter, so come to your own conclusions on that. So in this report it says, Amendments to Municipal Code Chapter 950, Traffic and Parking, additions to Section 950-400B. So yeah, a bylaw is applied to a corporation, and I just, with, I mentioned this at the police board before, I made a meme out of it. I, uh, with Mayor Tory's help, I made a meme out of this. He said at City Council a while back, there is one recommendation that does have a very direct role for the City of Toronto. Not the city as in the corporation, but for something to happen in this capital city of the province of Ontario. And I thank Mayor Tory at the police board for making such a great distinction between there's the City of Toronto, the corporation, and then there's Toronto, that's just the geographical area. So in this report, it also says, no person shall on any highway stop any vehicle on or over a boulevard unless stopping is authorized under any other municipal code, chapter, or bylaw. So I was wondering, what's the, anyone note the definition for person being used here? 
because I just want to make sure that the City of Toronto isn't using one of their lawyers to uh, deceive the people with one of their terms of art, as they call them. So another thing I've mentioned at the police board also is this court case, uh, Reed Cummings and uh, Ontario Minor Hockey Association, 1979, where the Court of Appeal for Ontario said, the only legal person known to our law is the corporation, the body corporate. So if you actually dig down, if you go into the weeds, as you put it, Councillor Hensley. Sorry, go to the... the remember when you talked about go, getting into the weeds? If, uh, it'd be a lot easier for the people to understand these bylaws if you just use, you know, a, per, a corporation instead of person, which is defined as a corporation. And you're probably wondering, well, what corporation does this apply to, Derek? And uh, Chair Pringle and I have a running gag at the police board. Uh, over here is, um, it's, it's hard for me to read that, but it's off of the website Dun & Bradstreet. It says there, names the corporation of the city of Toronto operating as John Tory. So that's the corporation that these bylaws actually apply to. So authorized under any other municipal code, chapter, or bylaw. And again, I want to thank the police board who last month let the cat out of the bag and explain what exactly, who exactly bylaws apply to. You mentioned, notice over here applicability. The provisions of this bylaw shall apply to all members and employees of the service and the board, which in this case, bylaws only apply to City of Toronto employees. So, you know, we don't vote you guys to pass these bylaws to trick us into uh, getting charged with laws that don't actually apply to us, so I don't consent to that. All right. Thank you, Derek. And I missed you at the library board last meeting, Councillor Hazy. I miss being there, too. Any questions of the deputant? Sorry, Derek, what quote was it? the Bible? What's that? What, what was the that? quote from the Bible? Oh, this, oh, sorry, this was from uh, book two of the Law of Nations by, uh, his last name is Vital, and it's in the police officer's manual by Gary P. Rodriguez, if you want to get into the weeds again regarding that stuff. Once in a while, it's good to get into the weeds. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Derek. Appreciate you coming in. Thanks you for the interest and your support of the Toronto Public Library as well. Uh, so our next deputy in. Is it the same item? Nope. Uh, number 27, uh, consideration of a startup and residency or STIR program in the City of Toronto. Brian Kelsey from the Toronto Region Board of Trade. Mr. Kelsey, you have uh, five minutes whenever you're ready. on this. Um, the Toronto Region Board of Trade has been recommending to uh, um, city officials since September uh, 2018 that the city consider launching a startup and residence program uh, as used in many other cities and we're pleased once again that Councillor Ainsley independently brought, uh, brought the idea independently to this committee. You've got a report before you recommending essentially uh, to not go ahead with this until next year or beyond. Um, I wanted to inform members of the committee of a couple of things, and that is first, uh, we at the Board of Trade had had two constructive meetings with city staff about how to operate uh, a STIR program since, uh, since you last met on this issue. Uh, the first took place before the report was drafted. The second uh, took place after, and it included uh, Andy Best, who in his previous role with the City of Guelph had implemented Guelph's program, uh, included a call-in from the City of Edmonton, which is uh, now uh, uh, through implementing its first round of this program, uh, and Cameron Sadiq from San Francisco, who is co-executive director of the City Innovate Foundation, which now helps uh, over 30 cities, counties, states, and provinces implement this program across uh, North America. A couple of things became clear at that second meeting that are not uh, clear from the report. And that is, uh, first we recommended this program that the city proceed as a way to help crack open the innovation culture at City Hall, in part because the cost to do this, the capacity needed to do this, is low as Guelph has demonstrated. Uh, uh, Andy Best said that in his own execution of the program at Guelph, their estimate of the costs uh, in general, without counting for staff time, which I'll get to, was 25000 to get to the point where they had the RFP and the challenges launched. Um, City Innovate now uh, streamlines that process with standardized legal documents, standardized procurement across the continent for a, f a membership fee to their foundation that the estimate for Toronto would be about 25000 per year, regardless of how many challenges are, are cycling through the system. So the costs are modest. There is staff cost to work with the challenge, 
but the idea is you're saving money on the other end. And again, Guelph's experience with the Alert Labs uh, challenge, they're now saving 18% water consumption per customer that's using the Alert Labs project that was tested with Guelph, which is critical for Guelph and saving capital costs because they rely on groundwater uh, for, their, uh, for the provision of their water service, and so now they don't need to spend extra capital dollars to expand to achieve their conservation goals and so forth. Uh, with respect to time, um, uh, Cameron and Sadiq kept on, on telling me, um, you know, part of what's distinct about this from, from other programs that the city's engaged in is that once you launch an RFP round, and it takes you time to get there, but once you launch a round, you get a result. It's either working or it's not working within between 16 to 28 weeks. That's standardized between most cities, most use a, cities use a 16-week residency. Some choose to use a slightly longer residency. Um, but I want to note that the, uh, the staff recommendation is essentially to hold this to uh, the budget cycle in 2020, and then at the end of the report, it references that there'd be a report back in 2021. By that point, Tiny Guelph will have uh, finished its fourth uh, challenge at a minimum. Uh, other cities are doing these annually or even biannually. Uh, Andy Best's exact words to me, which he uh, allowed me to quote, were, in that meeting, I kept telling them it was easy, but I didn't think they were going to go ahead with it anyway. Um, that this is uh, uh, something that can be running alongside other innovation programs, and there are many cities, I, I confirmed with Kansas City to name one that's smaller than Toronto, that are simultaneously running a mayor's level or centralized civic innovation office like our own. STIR programs and partnerships with nonprofits like uh, the one that's there. And why consider adding this to the arsenal that's there? I think the chief staff argument will be, well, we're already running innovation programs. Um, the first is that unlike the civic innovation program where the challenge uh, was to essentially reorganize the 311 program and you had one winner, which was a, a mid-sized company at best. This is oriented towards more creativity, more startups. It's a running cycle, so unlike the Bloomberg financing that you've got for the Civic Innovation Office, it doesn't run out, it doesn't end at an arbitrary date, which is one reason so many cities have bought into this. Uh, <clears throat> and last but not least, by engaging the startup community, which the Civic Whole Program, entirely meritable, doesn't do because it's focused on nonprofit participation. You also leverage more participation from potential corporate partners, which uh, a, a VC attended our meeting with city staff to make the point that he would be uh, supportive of companies that were winning challenges with the city through this model. Um, and you're more likely to, to get uh, longer term relationships uh, with companies committed to actually deliver the projects that are, that are there. So um, we believe that despite city concerns about capacity, it's possible to do all three and we encourage councillors to consider moving forward. Test this out. Uh, it's helping, again, over 30 other governments, including Edmonton, including the government of British Columbia here in Canada, um, get a more dynamic procurement process, get more partnerships with business, and so forth. Okay. Sorry for uh, thank you, over. Mr. Kelsey. Uh, questions of the deputant? Uh, so, so, Mr. Kelsey, so just to clarify, so the recommendations that are before us today were, this report came out last week. You had a the Toronto Board of Trade uh, had meetings, meeting with city staff and um, people who are already involved in STIR, the STIR program Correct. this past Tuesday? Uh, honestly, it's been a long couple of weeks, so my memory on the precise days are, but it was a day or two after the, uh, it was your council day, it was the first day of council. Yeah, last and, Tuesday. And uh, uh, yeah, it was that morning, 10 a.m. Yeah, and so at, at that point, city staff were supportive of the city moving forward with the STIR program? Well, and and consistent. I mean, we didn't ask them for a recommendation. We knew what the recommendation was in the document, which was this would be great, but don't do it soon. Um, and uh, there was, I think, a, a lively discussion with the um, with the veterans who've implemented this program already about what the. Uh, pitfalls and benefits would be that uh, we wished honestly had been scheduled before the report was written and certainly tried to do that. I'll leave it to city staff to speak to, for themselves, of course, about what their impressions were. But um, again, one of the reasons we've recommended this to Toronto that I think became, I, I hope became uh, crystal clear through the testimony of uh, the veterans who've already implemented this is we got a lot of questions about things like, well, how do you manage uh, the legalities of the relationship between the startup staff who you're partnering with and city staff. 
And the answer uh, from City Innovate, which is now as a foundation in the business of exporting San Francisco's experience with this, is of course, we've already worked through those questions through four years and dozens of cities that have done this and now have standardized legal agreements to deal with those issues uh, because the kinks have been worked out. So while there are a number of different ways that the City of Toronto could implement this, one of the easiest would be to do what Edmonton already has and work through that very affordable project. I was surprised at how low their membership fees were, and the benefit of doing so is not only you're working with uh, legal agreements that are already there, uh, but they also manage the continent-wide process of advertising to startups so that you have the maximum possible number of potential businesses coming to Toronto to try and uh, partner with the city and uh, contribute to solving those cha challenges. And we get that all for $25,000? Uh, it takes you to the point uh, where you have, because they've systematized the process, where you have the contact with startups, where you have the challenge. It's important to emphasize that their model, for all the obvious reasons counselors can think of, is that once they're submitting to you a list of 12 qualified candidates, it's then up to City Hall, obviously, to make the decision on who's actually won the challenge based on what criteria. They just manage the output of advertising the challenge, the process of working with standardized agreements, and the input in terms of bringing uh, bringing vendors to you who comply with requirements that are set by the city. Okay, all right. Thank you, Mr. Kelsey. Appreciate you coming in this morning. My pleasure. That was unexpected. Okay, um, so quick releases. Sorry? Quick releases. Yep, quick releases. Councillor Karagiannis. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, this would be GL 6.25. I had a conversation with staff. I knew there was a speaker on that item, and I'm ready to move staff recommendations and thank them for their hard work. Sorry, I missed which number? GL 6.25, increasing penalty amounts for stopping and parking violations. Okay, and I, I do have a motion that staff asked me to move to clarify, still on which they're still working on. Okay. Okay. Councillor Holliday, quick release. I do. Uh, GL 6.29, the Fair Wage Office, annual report. I have a, uh, a motion for a future report. So it doesn't affect this year's, but in the 2019, so next year's annual report, I wanted staff to include some information on how the province of Ontario does this for comparison. Okay. Ours is older than theirs. Okay, any questions of the mover on this? None, all in favor? Just another item, Mr. Chair. Quick release. Which one? Uh, GL 6.28, uh, oh. spoke with staff and we're in agreement that this can be something that could be addressed in the, the second quarter of, uh, of, uh, of 2020. Okay. And I'd like to defer the item to uh, second quarter of 2020, GL 6.28, and staff isn't agreeable to it. Okay. So this is a deferral motion? Deferral. So anybody have any questions into the mover? So we're deferring number 28 until the second quarter of 2020. All in favor? Sorry? Record it. Okay. All in favor? Councillor Fillion, was that a yes? Thank you. All in favor? Councillors Fillion, Karajanis, Ainsley, Matlow, opposed? Councillor Holliday, that passes. <coughs> Any other quick releases? Sorry, and I did hold number uh, 27, which is consideration of the startup and residence STIR program. I did want to make an amendment uh, to the fourth, sorry, the third changing the report back time from the second quarter of 2019 to our meeting on October 7th, 2000, and, sorry, from the second quarter of 2020 to our meeting on October 7th, 2019. So the recommendation was to report back in the second quarter of 2020. This is for which item? The STIR. The startup and residency program, number 27. Okay. So I'm asking for a report back next October. 
2020? But I thought we had to go to the budget person. This is a report back on how to implement it. Not asking for money. All in favor? Carried. Any other quick releases? Seeing none. Uh, so just for members of the public, so this committee breaks for an hour from 12.30 to 1.30, and we resume here at 1.30. Thank you very much, everyone. Yes, sir. This one still. They're still cleaning up the motion that staff sent me. 